Assalamu alaikum, peace and love, beautiful people. Welcome back to the Travelers Podcast. I'm Brother Ali. The response to last week's episodes, we dropped two of them uh, to kick things off. The first one is called The Opening, um, and it's basically me recounting and reliving stories from my life that have been foundational in shaping and forming who I am and how I am and how I understand myself in the world. Uh, it's like three hours of me talking about myself. And the response has been really beautiful and really overwhelming, honestly. Uh, people just talking about the way that, that certain stories or, or different parts of my narrative and journey have really related to them. And I heard a lot about bullying, to be honest, and heard a lot about race and heard a lot about identity. you know. And it really affirms the idea of this podcast and the intention behind it, that human beings are on this journey of life. We're co-travelers in this journey. We're here together for a reason. you know. I believe, and most of the wisdom traditions believe that we were somewhere before here and that we'll be somewhere after here. But this particular realm you know, of space and time, this, this part of our journey that we're on is really revealing. It, it reveals to us who we are and what we're made of. And so walking this road together has a lot of meaning. And we learn about ourselves from seeing ourselves reflected in each other. And so that's the intention of this podcast, you know. So a lot of great response to that, that really, it was really affirming of the reason that we're doing this podcast. And then the second episode was with the incomparable, the one and only, the great Dr. Cornell West, um, I mean, you can't really go wrong talking to Cornell West, you know what I mean? Just one of the beautiful things that I wanted to do in this podcast is just really show the side of these people that I'm able to experience. Like, these are my friends, these are my teachers, these are my mentors. And so, you know, just being able to have a conversation with someone like that and to share it with the world is really a beautiful thing. You know... I've wanted to have a podcast for a long time. I've thought about it for a long time. And just like everything else that we dream about, once once you start doing it, you know, that's the most difficult part because you know, then, but you transition from somebody who's thinking about something and talking about something and dreaming about something to the person that's doing it. But the reason that that's so hard to do is because we're entering into new territory. And that's the way that I feel. And it was, honestly, it was difficult. I went back and listened to those episodes and it was challenging for me to listen to because I'm just like, why are you so slow? And like, what's taking, you know, what are you doing? But to be really honest, it's also really exciting because you know, I remember the fact that I got on the mic for the first time to, to rhyme on a microphone that was going through speakers when I was eight years old. My grandmother asked me what I wanted to do when I, when I grew up, and I told her in 1984, 85, I want to be a rapper. I want to be an MC when I grow up. And at that time, they didn't even think that hip-hop music would be around that long. And then also nobody that looks like me was doing it. And so they were just like, oh, that's crazy. That's not a real job. You know, that's not a real art form. You know, you need to be thinking about something that you can be and all this stuff. But my grandmother was an early childhood education professor. And so she said, Any, you can be anything that you do every day, anything that you dedicate yourself to. You, that's how you become it by giving yourself over to it. You give yourself to the practice of that thing. And by practicing that thing, then you become it. You know, and then the, the vocation of it comes later, but you transform yourself into that thing by doing it every day. And so she encouraged me. And when she died, she died of cancer. And after the funeral, they left the microphone on him. But at the whole time, I'm just looking at the mic. So I always want a mic. I see, you know, Slick Rick on the mic and I see Run DMC on the mic. I see Houdini on the mic. And I'm like, you know, I'm hearing all this stuff about the microphone. So I go up there and I touch it, ding, 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 and it's still on. And I got on and I started doing Houdini and Run DMC and Slick Rick and all this stuff. And people came back into the hall and they were, they were listening to me. And it felt like, you know, a tribute to my grandmother because she told me to do it. And ever since then, I've been on the mic wherever I could get on one, you know, whether it was school dances and talent shows and community events. I used to do Rondo Days and Juneteenth and dances and anywhere where I could get on the mic, I did it. And I always had this feeling like I can, there's something for me on this microphone. But I, I knew that I hadn't quite found it yet. And then, 
you know, when I was in my mid twenties, we made my first album, Shadows on the Sun, and Atmosphere was about to head out on their first real extensive national tour. They had done some touring, but they were celebrating, releasing, promoting this groundbreaking underground independent hip hop classic album called God Loves Ugly. This is 2002, and my big brother Slug, who's like, you know. Like Dr. West says, I am who I am because somebody loved me. Like there's, I'm not me without him. You know, he opened up so much in my life, you know, and, and gave me opportunities to become who and what I am. And he started that, that year, he said, you know, I'm going out. We're going to do 63 shows in 10 weeks. So if you do the math, that's over, you know, you got 10 weeks, 60 some shows. So we're doing six shows a week. And some weeks we're doing seven or eight shows. Some of those nights we had two shows a night. We're going to hit every nook and cranny in this country and we're not coming home until we're done. And so we, me and BK1, Brendan Kelly, who's the producer of this podcast, rolled out on that tour. He was my DJ. And we knew that we had something to offer. Like I knew that I could find a voice in this thing. But I knew that I wasn't there yet, but the experience of it, just getting those hours in on stage with all of these different uh, situations and all these different things. What happens if you, you know, you're in South Carolina and like we're in this place where I don't know if these people have ever been to a hip hop show before. You know what I'm saying? Or we get to another place and the, and the sound system just goes out in the middle of my set. What do you do? You know what I mean? Uh, or we're in a place and like the, the lights are so close to the turntables that they're, they're warping the records. You know what I'm saying? So all the records are skipping and we can't get through a, a full song. Because at that time, it's like vinyl records with the, with, the, with the music on it. So what do you do? You know what I'm saying? And different types of audiences and, you know, and I'm learning myself. So the experience brings about a level of confidence. And then the confidence brings about the ability to be comfortable and then that comfort is where you start to find who, I, who you are and you start to find your own voice. So that happened on the first tour that I went on. And even after that, I mean, there's things that like if you see, if you see me perform from 2010 until now, I have this like touchstone thing that I always come back to any, any crowd I'm in front of. Do you feel good in here? Say, yes, I do. Uh, do you love the music in here? Say, yes, I do. Did you come here to celebrate? Say, yes, I did. Do you love the person you came here with? Say, yes, I do. Somebody say, love, 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 love. I do that all throughout the show. I didn't start doing that till 2010. So that was eight years in, even after the tour. So I just say all that to say, that's how I feel about where I'm at on this podcast journey. You know, I, I, I know that I love conversation. I love talking to people. I love sharing with people. You know, I've been doing this for years. I have amazing, incredible friends. I got amazing, incredible listeners, you know, that supporters that I'm not starting from scratch. I'm starting with a lot of very serious advantages, you know, because you don't have to be a master to interview Cornell West. Like you just basically say, you basically start a conversation and just let him go. But what I'm learning is that it's very different to be on this side of the microphone, uh, to, to have to, to, to be thinking about the pace and the direction and to be facilitating and think about the timing of things and how are we going to end this and what directions are we going in. It's very, very different. But I'm really grateful to be doing it. My grandfather was a, was a journalist. So the, you know, that was my grandmother on my mother's side that encouraged me to be an MC. Her husband, my grandfather, was, a, was also, they were both professors at University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he was a journalist and he taught journalism and he also was an author. And when you would talk to him, he would interview you, you know, and this is the way that he related to people. But it made, it made me as a kid feel important and feel seen and feel cared about, you know. And so she died of cancer, he died of suicide. And then my mother died of cancer and my father died of suicide. Amazing. I'm, I say in a, my song called Father Figures, I'm from a long line of writers and teachers, spend all of my time with guides and seekers and criminals and preachers, sifting through the secrets just to kick them through your speakers. These tears just flowing my whole life long. Look in the mirror, I still see my mom writing songs for the love of love, for the hope of hope, for every one of us to hold the rope that won't be broke. So. I'm just very grateful to be on this journey, and the fact that you're on the, with us, it means a lot to me. Uh, this week on the Travelers Podcast, we have Keith Ellison. I've known Keith for 25 years, uh, one of the most sincere people that, I could, that you'd ever want to know. Um, he's a very, very authentic person. Um, he's a person that 
doesn't need anything from this world. You know, like he ended up being in public life, but it's not because he wanted power or prestige or fame or recognition or anything like that. He's a genuine, true servant of the people. He's been that way ever since I've met him, ever since I've known him. And we get into that on the podcast. But Keith is also, I'm not exaggerating when I say that he is one of the um, pivotal Uh, historic figures in American life, particularly as it relates to human rights, justice, the black freedom struggle. You know, we have a history in America that goes all the way back to the very beginning of what what were called slave patrols, you know, that, that when enslaved people were able to escape, or even, you know, oftentimes people would become quote unquote free you know what I'm saying? And be able to leave the condition of, of servitude and, and being enslaved and having been, you know, captured and bred into the institution of American chattel slavery. They had p- p- patrols that would go and basically round up black people just based on the fact that they're black and sell them back into slavery and, and, and return them to slavery and bondage. Even people that were born free, even people that came from other countries. And then we have this long history of both paid officers of the state uh, harassing, beating, brutalizing, and killing black people, especially black men, um, with no, with with very little or no consequence at all, and this is a tradition that that continues on to this very day. Every every uh, generation of black people in America, you hear them talk about this. So you listen to Richard Pryor, you know what I mean. Uh, oh, come on, those beatings, those people were resisting arrest. The fact that white body people don't understand and don't know because it's not their experience. Because there, there really are at least two very, very different experiences of life in America. And I talk in the first episode of this podcast about the fact that people are confused about albinism and also I've been socialized around black people. So oftentimes people relate to me and think that I'm black. And I've had policemen think that I'm black. And I know the difference between how they respond to me and the way my body feels and the, my, my relationship with safety if they think I'm black versus when they can when they don't think that. So, you know, Keith's role in all of this, not only was he the first uh, congressman to represent the American people in the U.S. Congress, Muslim congressman, was sworn in on Thomas Jefferson's copy of the Quran, not the Bible. That's the first time that that happened in this country. You know, and America has a long relationship between justice, Islam, and Africans. And we talk about that in this episode. You know, but also then he left the the Congress to become the Attorney General of the state of Minnesota. And when George Floyd was murdered in South Minneapolis, you know, just very close to where the producer of this podcast, Brendan, and his family live. And my wife is one of a small handful of black uh, women therapists, community health, community mental health workers in the city of Minneapolis in the state of Minnesota. And she works, her office is, is blocks from where George Floyd was murdered, you know. And we were in Minneapolis when that happened, you know. And to see, to, to just watch that footage of this police officer kneeling on a person's neck and he's screaming for his mother and he's screaming, oh, you're killing me. And everyone say, what are you doing? You're killing him. And he's just looking in the camera with his hand in his pocket because he knows nothing's going to happen to me because I got 450 years of nothing happening to me, you know. And then you got Ah- Ahmaud Arbery that was also just, you know, hunted down by, not by police officers, but by vigilantes. And you had Trayvon Martin and you got Terrence Franklin and you got, you know, on and on and on and on and on. Breonna Taylor, you know, over and over and over again. And one of the things that Keith mentions in this episode is that black people are not the only ones that are killed by police. And he talks about the fact that what's being done here is part of the black freedom struggle, but it really is also part of the process of people being human and, and, and the relationship between law enforcement, paid officers of the state with guns and licenses to kill and their relationship to that power and common people and the people that are deemed to be important and seen and, and worthy versus those who aren't. So he talks about the relationship between the black freedom struggle and justice for poor white people that live in rural places. And, and it's extremely important. So Keith, you know, we lived in, 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 in South Minneapolis at the time that this happened, and it erupted, you know, and they burned down the police precinct. 
And, you know, there's all kind of uh, stories and speculation, but it, it really seems as though the, the, the destroying of property and breaking and things like that and burning didn't start from the black community and protesters. It just, I just don't believe that that's the case. But we lived in that neighborhood at that time, you know, and this is stuff that I've worked on and been vocal about and my wife works on, you know. Uh, you know, my wife has lived in, in, some of the most racially volatile situations in American life. She was born in the South Bronx and Harlem. She lived in Harlem in the South Bronx. Then she lived in Florida. And then she moved to Minnesota thinking it's all good. And then you got, you know, our neighborhood being burned down. You know, a lot of, a lot of things in our neighborhood were burned. And we lived in a blue collar kind of like diverse neighborhood, working class neighborhood where um, white supremacists came into North Minneapolis where, where I, I lived when I was a teenager that's mostly black. And then anarchists came to South Minneapolis and we were outside at night defending our homes because they were burning things down and they were, you know, people were putting uh, kerosene and gasoline in containers lining the, the alleyways so that they could come back later and start it on fire. People were stealing cars. You know, we live, you walk out in the morning and tear gas and smoke in the morning sky. You know, you walk outside and you're just smelling smoke and tear gas and people are being arrested and all of this stuff. So we live through this and it's like over and over and over and over again, there's no consequences for these police officers. But this time, my friend, my brother, Keith Ellison is, is heading the campaign or is, is, is leading the, the, uh, the trial of these officers. You know, and then not long after, another one, you know, Dante Wright, was killed, you know, and and now we have Amir Locke. There's another one, you know. You can't even keep track of them. So, you know, we're talking to Keith Ellison, the one who tried, you know, that that former police officer. I I don't even want to say his name, but he was tried and it got a conviction, you know. And then Ahmad Arbery's killers got convicted as well. And then, you know, Dante Wright's uh, killer got convicted as well. This is a this is a turning point in American history. And I'm very blessed, and I think we're very blessed on this podcast to be able to talk to the individual who has dedicated his life to this. You know, and, and he talks about, you'll hear, but he talks about his family history and he talks about you know, his own journey. And so we're just very, very grateful to be able to do that on the Travelers Podcast. We are sponsored and brought to you in, in partnership with the, the Zakat Foundation. Uh, with the National Black Doll Museum, I can't wait to tell you about them, uh, with Vice Gerent and with UPF. And uh, so enjoy this episode. And thank you very much for being here on the Travelers Podcast. It's just one of the great honors of my life to, to know you and to consider you a brother. I think we've known each other for upwards of 20 years, maybe 25 even. And, could, it be, um, could easily be there. Yeah, man. So I want to start with a story, if it's okay, that sure. I, I probably have told you, but I, I'm not sure if you've ever ho- heard that. Our, our friendship is made up of like 215 minute conversations because <laughs> you're always coming and going like you're always, you know, and people are always pulling you in a million directions. And it's been that way before you were holding elected office. You've just always been known as a as a servant and really almost like the property of the community um, since the day that I met you. But I want to make sure that you know, and I want to say on the mic, that my career began uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, because a mutual friend of ours was pulled over by the police, a Muslim brother, let's not say his name, he'd be asked us not Mm -hmm, to say his mm -hmm. name, but you know who I mean. This Mm -hmm. is one of those brothers that, I mean, you know, extremely disciplined in the religion of Islam. Uh, they pulled him over. They accused him of drunk driving. They pulled him, they broke his window, pulled him out of the car. They pulled his wife out of the car, a Muslim woman that wears the headscarf and would mm-hmm. prefer not to shake hands with men and things like that. Men searched her. And, you know, and then as they always do, when they go too far, they accuse the person of something and they put something on the books. They put him in jail for the weekend. And you, as an attorney at that time, took on his case pro bono. You got the charges against him dropped, and you also represented him, and he won a settlement against the state of Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And yep. that settlement is what paid for my demo tape. 
So the demo tape that wow. I brought to Sadiq at Rhyme Sayers in 2000 was made with money that that brother lent me from that incident and from that settlement wow. that he won for him. So really, in more ways than one, my career is, is I, I owe all of the things that I've been able to do to you because I wouldn't have been able to get started without that. So I just wanted to thank you publicly for that. Well, I, I thank I thank you, brother, because you know you've you know you've done so. I remember you were one of the like the young brothers in the master, right? And there was a, like a little crew, and you guys, uh, very very disciplined Muslims, also uh, performing artists, writers, all that. And uh, you guys were an inspiration. And whenever I uh, see or hear of your music or whatever you're doing. It's just always just a thrill to know that I've known you since you were really pretty young guy. I guess you probably were in your early 20s, late teens at the time. I was 15, right? brother. 15, 15, 15 I years just, old. You know, I just got married, so it probably seemed like, I, you know, I got married at 17. And You know, but I mean, but the bottom line is you and, you know, a few other brothers were just right there doing what you were doing, committed to your craft. You, you, you became world famous doing it. And, um, you know, and here you are now. And I tell you this, I have always believed that there's a very tight link between artistic expression and inspiring social movements. Mm -hmm. And you are staying right at the nexus of those two things. People um, have gotten out there in the street working on housing, working on police accountability, working on justice, working on democracy, whatever, because they heard your music. Mm -hmm. And it just made them feel like, oh, I have to do something. It's like, oh, you know, it's like Marvin Gaye. It's like, um, you know, it's like Billie Holiday and Strange Fruit. I mean, it just moves people. So it's good to be together, man, always, always. Well, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants you know, and yeah, that way we, do. we don't have to necessarily measure our own height. Right. You right. know what I mean? Because, like, we know the people yeah. that we come from, and it's just, it becomes our duty and really honor and privilege to try to make them proud and to try to do their justice, uh, to do right, you know, with their legacy, the legacy that they, that they handed us. Along those lines, I want to start by asking you about your family. Your family has generations sure that, you know, we know that uh, our, our brother, your son, Jeremiah Bay Ellison is the fifth ward yeah. city council representative in the city of Minneapolis. But I want to know how far back it goes in your family. I know that your mother's father was organizing uh, black voters in Louisiana and the Ku Klux Klan was burning crosses on his yard. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. is this the, do, do we know how far back it goes? Do, I mean, is this something that goes all the way back to the, the African continent? Like how far back do we know about your family? Well, all I know, all I know is that, you know, I, I have ancestors who were um, uh, actually, so, so my family history is, a, is, is, a some, is somewhat of a complicated one. My family comes from a, a, a piece of the uh, American story uh, that is rooted in, in, in Louisiana, where people, um, you know, the, the Louisiana was ruled by the French at one time, the Spanish by another time. Of course, it started out as indigenous land and then ended up in the hands of the Americans. And it's interesting because, you know, there's there's a, there's a varied story there. And, um, you know, my 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 uh, every ever since there's been people in my family line that we can track, they've been struggling for freedom, justice and equality, man. You know, so uh, Frank Martinez, my grandfather, he was uh, organizing black voters in rural Louisiana uh, when it, it was in the 50s, you know, and so. Not only do they burn crosses across the street from the house, they boycotted him and said, we will not sell you no gas because you over there stirring up a fuss with them and ain't no problems around here and what y'all need to vote for. And they wouldn't sell him any. They literally boycotted the man. He had to get tractor fluid out of the uh, out of my uncle's uh, um, from his farm. Right. <laughs> and then the other thing, you know, that they would do to him is um, they they would call the house, you know, and it would say to my my mom. And my grandmother, we got that end tied up to a, to a tree. He ain't going to make it. Now, thank God they didn't. They were lying. But they were trying to use that to terrorize him. 
and they were trying to get him to get it. They were trying to get his wife to get him to to not organize anyone. And because you're like, Frank, you can't do this. This is dangerous. These people ain't playing with you. And so, you know, maybe get him to stop. And he uh, died in 1958 in a tractor accident. And uh, yet, you know, you walk around Natchitoches today and they all, everybody knows Frank, you know, and, you know, he, uh, he was the product of a African-American mom and a guy who immigrated from S- Sevilla, Spain, mm-hmm. right? That's where the Martinez and, comes and, from. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, this guy, you know, and so uh, uh, he, they went first to, he went from Spain, he went from Sevilla to, to uh, the first place he went to was to Cuba. And then ended up in New Orleans and then came and then ended up going to northern Louisiana and had a bunch of kids and started farming. And my my grandfather was the product. And I guess I'm the product. So there's that, you know, and um, and then, you know, uh, you know, my 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 grandmother, his my Frank Martinez's wife was was a teacher. She was teaching, you know, poor black kids in rural Louisiana when you had in a segregated school system. One, you know, and so, you know, some ways. He's doing all this heroic stuff, standing up to the bullies. What she's doing is heroic, too, because she's trying to lend service to people who, you know, the world's trying to sideline and completely push away from any kind of opportunity. And so, you know, I tell you, when I was in Natchitoches last time, this lady who's a city council member in Natchitoches, Natchitoches, she goes to me, she says, your grandmother was my teacher (laughs) and she came every morning. And, you know, it was just it was it was heartbreaking, you know. And this lady who was talking to me was probably 20 years older than me, but she, my grandmother taught her. And the, But this is the kind of folks they were. They farmed. I come, um, you know, I, I was born in Detroit because my, my, my mom left. She, you know, she went to Xavier, which is a black college in New Orleans. And she came up to Detroit, ended up meeting my father, married him. And my father, my father's from a place called uh, Sardis, Georgia, you know. And, uh, you know, my dad grew up in Detroit, but he, his family was right there from rural Georgia and right on the Savannah River. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, we end up in Detroit, which is a very common story when it comes to, um, you know, the, dia- the black diaspora. It's like, it's like called the Great Migration. Mm-hmm. People leaving the Deep South come mm-hmm. to the North. And then, I didn't, we, you know, we basically stayed one generation in Detroit. I'm in Minnesota my other brother is in Boston. My other brother is in North Carolina. So, you know, and then I got two brothers in Detroit. Specifically, the link between Georgia and Detroit. So, in in uh, the area of Sandersville, Georgia, you got Barry Gordy coming yeah. from uh, Sandersville, Georgia, to Detroit and build yep. this amazing, you know, black musical and, and cultural empire in Motown. Yeah, and then also sure you does. got Clara and Elijah Poole, who becomes Elijah That's Muhammad, right. who come from Sandersville, Georgia, to Detroit as well. And, and right. build possibly the greatest, you know, national movement of, of, of black yeah. Americans that ever existed, you know, rivaling yeah. may, maybe only by Marcus Garvey's movement, you know, yeah. th- that, that, that. And then also you got your family as well coming that, that connection from, from Detroit on your dad's side. So I want to talk, we're, yeah. we're going to talk more about your mom, inshallah, but I want to talk a little bit about Leonard Ellison, your, yeah. your uh, wonderful belated, fa- belated father, who is a psychiatrist. Yeah. And so your dad was practicing psychiatry in the black community in Detroit in the 60s and 70s? He sure was. And and by the way, we still got my dad. He's 93 years old. Okay. We did lose my mom. You yeah. probably heard. Yeah, it's yeah. my mom who we lost. And okay. so, but my dad is still kicking it at 93. I'll preserve and, him. 93 years old. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing a lot, right? And he, um, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Here he is. You know, uh, son of people who were on the farm, you know, uh, my grandfather only went to like the third or fourth grade, uh, maybe. And, and, and uh, you know, and but they were they hustled, man. Hmm. They were hustlers. They didn't they didn't let no moss grow up under their feet. Right. So my dad, uh, interestingly enough, the, I read a book that really kind of changed my life and it's called Black Rage. And it was by two black psychiatrists. And my father says to me read this book. So I read it. And that's sort of like the introduction of my, of me to American history as a, as a narrative. Right. And, and, uh, you know, he was always feeding us books and he still does. Right. And he doesn't read that much anymore, but he does listen to a lot of books on tape, you know, mm. and when he had a stroke, it's just hard to sort of track the, the, the lines on the page. But 
you know, that's what what he did. That's what he's doing. And my dad, um, you know, who did he represent? Who did he serve? Who did he serve? He served auto workers. He served regular folks who were going through crisis, Mm -hmm. you know. And my brother is a a, a doctor in Detroit right now. His name is also Leonard Ellison, Mm -hmm. you know. And and my brother uh, is not a psychiatrist. He's a family care doctor. And what does he do? He cares for the needs of uh, aging people. Mm -hmm. He does a lot of what they call gerontology. So, yeah, man, I mean, to me, that's service, right? That's Absolutely. service. That's, 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 that's trying to be a benefit to your, to, to, to humanity. And I'm proud of it, you know, my, and, uh, you know, my other brother, Brian, he's a Christian pastor in Detroit. My mother was very Catholic mm. and my brother, me and my mom never had no beefs on religion. She like, you Muslim, you sure? Good. Give me his ham. I'm like, okay, <laughs> right, <Ma. laughs> More for me. <laughs> More for me, you know. So we were good. But my mom and my brother, who's a Protestant minister, used to have like these theological discussions. And it was always interesting because it was very tolerant, inclusive environment. But my mom was a thinker. My dad was a questioner. And whatever you say you was going to do, they would ask you why you're doing it, what you hope to achieve. And I just grew up like that. I grew up having to defend my position mm-hmm. at five years old. Why do you want that bike? Is that the right color? <laughs> like, you know. So they, this is who raised me, man. They were a lot of fun. My mother was a tremendous joker, and so was my dad. You know, but um, they'll challenge you, and that's the environment I grew up in. And they were, and that's the environment they grew up in, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. your father is a, a psychiatrist in Detroit in the yep. '60s, '70s. So he's early to to this idea, that, you know, that we're now just starting to accept nationally, but particularly, you know, there's a, there's talk about in the black community specifically that there's a stigma around mental health oh, and yeah. around holistic health, and we have a mutual friend in Resma Menikin, who I oh, saw man, actually, I you know, my son and I actually saw him as clients, and he remains, oh, you know, yeah. a brilliant author and speaker and educator, and and he's a therapist. And grandma's hands, everybody. My Go grandmother's buy a hands, absolutely. I was yeah. just talking to Dr. Cornell West about that book. He hadn't read it yet. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. But I, I, I screamed that from the mountaintops, you know. And talking about generational trauma that we inherit from the people that came before us, that fl- fight and flight and freeze. But specifically, oh, yeah. my grandmother's hands talks about racialized trauma, and yep. uh, Brother Resma talks about white bodies and the freezing that happens. He says that all of the things that white bodies did to black bodies, they first did to other white bodies and had done to them in Europe. When you say like, you know, in a... In uh, Pulp Fiction, when the man, I'm gonna go medieval on his ass, like medieval is talking <laughs> about something that you know that that white people did to other white people, and then came, yep. you know, to to the shores of America and started to do to others. Yep. And he also talks about the the you know the sensations in the the bodies of the children of enslaved Africans and and what you know. Yep. And he also talks about police and what happens in their bodies when they interact with different people with, with these different legacies. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. for you, you know, for you to be sitting in a courtroom and, and I want to talk more about your story in general to lead up to this point. But I mean, these are major moments in the history of our country when, mm. when you're prosecuting on behalf of and, and you know, speaking up for and, and, and fighting for justice for Dante Wright and George Floyd and all of these, but those specifically, you know, I've seen you in all of these situations where you've been able to just keep so cool and calm and collected and on message and people have attacked you personally and people have done everything in their power to get you to, you know, what is it that you're drawing from that allows you to be so laser focused in those moments? And is there a type of bypass that needs to happen in that moment? Well, you know, brother, um, I got to tell you, I thought the same thing about you when you go up in front of all them people and perform so brilliantly. How do you stay calm in a situation like that? Well, I tell you, prayer helps. Mm. It does. Prayer meditation helps. And we live in a world where the predominant theme is sort of skepticism about religion and faith. And if you're actually really sophisticated, you're supposed to be not religious, yes, right? Yeah. Well, um, I guess I'm not that sophisticated because to me, it's my comfort, right? It's my comfort. It's what 
helps me stay flat footed and clear on the ground is what helps me remember what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. <clears throat> it helps me um, remain grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It allows me to uh, see the humanity in even the ugliest human behavior. Yes, sir. You know? Yeah. So that's the thing. And you know good and well, I'm nowhere close to being no saint. I'm, I'm, I'm so far away from where I think God could lead me to. But I don't know that. That's how it, sincere people talk. But I don't know. Yeah, I don't know nothing well, about that. Well, <laughs> there you go. But, but I just going to say that to the degree that I'm able to hang on and keep focus is because, you know, you know that, that alarm clock goes off around five or whatever and you hit the floor. You know, and, um, you know, and it, and it just keeps you reminded mm -hmm. and it keeps you clear. And I remember praying as an early Muslim because I'm a convert and, and I didn't and I just felt like I was doing some body thing. But then and this is really interesting relative to Resma. When I my body would miss it. Mm -hmm. There's yes. something in the body. Yes, sir. Because as you know, Salat is a is a physical. You don't just stop and say a prayer in your head. You're doing something. You're saying something. And <clears throat> that brought me tremendous comfort. And I'm going to tell you, my faith and my prayer schedule uh, got better as I got under intense, intense uh, attack, mm -hmm. you know. So when they turn up the heat, I turn up the prayers, right, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's my only answer, brother. And, you know, I got this... Uh, poster on, on the wall in my house that said, I still remember praying for things that I have now. Right? Yeah. I still remember. I mean, I was praying for this and now it's here manifest. And it's not just things like objects, you know, like this pen right, or right, this right. phone. Yeah. It's peace. Yeah. It's peace of mind. It is calm. Mm -hmm. It is the, the 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 love of community and these things, you know. Uh, and I, and I would say, if you are really trying to find peace, you you're not really going to find it if you're just trying to get enough money, or you're just trying to, oh, I'm if I get me a good wife, then I'll be cool. If I get enough money, then I'll be cool. If I buy a house, then I'll be cool. If I buy a right car, then I'll be cool. That ain't you will never be cool thinking like that. You're going to be cool, calm, collected, and at peace when you accept the fact that there's only one worthy of worship. Mm -hmm. Only in, in your in your bank account is not it. Mm -hmm. And neither is that fancy ride you, don't, you think you're trying to buy. It's only one worthy of worship. And if you worship to the one who is worthy of worship, then it has a calming effect. And then if you remember how much that one has provided you, mm -hmm. right? Starting with health, starting with breath, starting with life, starting with family. Then it, it will have an effect on your mind and it will improve your quality of life. <clears throat> Allah asks us to praise him, not because he needs praise, because he's far beyond any, we can't flatter God. That's right, right? that's right. <laughs> you know, we can't flatter God. That's like, right, that's on, right. Please, please. But what we can do is remember that the praise does not come to us. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't need the praise because we don't know what to do with it. All we're gonna do is mess it up. Once we think that this is all because we're so smart, so handsome, so talented, we're just gonna mess it up. So you give that praise to who can handle it, and then it it allows you to be more effective and allows you to be more calm and at peace. You know, I want to, I think one of the reasons that I mistakenly thought that your father had passed, and I'm so grateful that he's still here, I pray Allah give him a long life and preserve him and, and, and give him all good. And uh, I wish I could thank him personally, you know what I mean, for the, for the, for the, I, you know, I know you, you're, you're one of five. Yep. Yeah, man. So, I, you know. I'm in the middle, okay. too older, too younger. Yeah, uh, someday I hope to be in Detroit, and maybe if uh, if you'll if oh you love him, me, man. I'll, I'll They're all characters, hug. man. Yeah, you he would that would be wonderful, man. And my brothers would love you, man. They would they would it would be great. Inshallah, we'll, we'll meet up in Detroit one day, and we'll we'll spend a little time if we can if we can. Man, they got they got the best bean pie in the world in Detroit. That's the that's the home of the bean pie. 
They got it there. They got a lot of cool things in Detroit. <clears throat> Detroit is actually a very interesting town. I mean, it is sort of the intersection of the class move struggle and the racial justice struggle. It kind of intersects right there. There's a great man, a man who I admire tremendously, named Walter Ruther, who was the head of the United Auto Workers uh, back in the day. Uh, and he was one of the first to say, you know what? If us unions don't include our black brothers and sisters, they will be, you know, they're going to suffer. And we are, too, because Mr. For- Mr. Ford is going to try to use our animosity to strike break. So they just got wise enough to say, let's get let's everybody get in here. And Walter Ruther and Martin Luther King marched on Woodward Avenue together before the March on Washington. Amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a before. I mean, what, Woodward Avenue was the main drag of Detroit. It's kind of like, I mean, there's really no equivalent in Minneapolis. I mean, because there's several main drags in Minneapolis, right? You get, I guess Hennepin is is a main drag. Lake Street. But like Wood, Lake Street. Broadway. But Minneapolis, Broadway, right. But like, but like in Detroit, it really is, you live on the east side of Woodward, you live on the east side, you live on the west side of Woodward, you live on the west side. So it's kind of like this big divider. So, um... They, but they so they walk down this main drag together, signal in Detroit. Obviously, like you know, you and I both know, you know, the Klan and, and, and all them bad guys. They're not just down in Louisiana and Alabama, Mississippi. That's right. That's right. They, there's plenty of them in Indiana and in Ohio they and in Michigan in and in Min- right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, right. Malcolm's father then, was Malcolm's then, father was killed by the KKK in Nebraska in Omaha. Nebraska. And he said, "Stop right. talking and about we, the South." Long as, why, as long as you're <laughs> south of the Canadian border, you're in the south. <laughs> That's right. Well, look, you know, you and I are from Minnesota. Mm-hmm. In 1920, they uh, lynched three guys in uh, Duluth. In, 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 in Duluth. Yeah. So, you know, and then we have 39 Native people being uh, lynched. On Christmas, uh, right? In, or New uh, Year's? I think it was, yeah, something like Christmas or 1865 or, I mean, right, right there, yeah. right in there. And something I better look up because... But I think it was December 26th or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they, so, they, they wanted to kill many more. Yes, they, right. they had many yes, more yes, people yes, that they wanted to, to publicly execute true. at that time as well. That is right. That is true. So this is the world we're living in, brother. We got we to gotta try to make it better. So was your mother's name pronounced Clita or Clyda? Clyda. Clyda. My mother's name is Clyda Cora Maria Teresa Martinez Ellison. Can you say it one In more her time, family please? tradition. Can, can you run it down <laughs> one more Cora time? Maria I just want to let Teresa. that. <laughs> yeah, Clyde Cora Maria Teresa Martinez Ellison. For the record. So, uh, for the record, and uh, she was she was something else, man. She she gave us eighty two years to be with us, uh, and you know it's funny because I don't really, uh, I'm I'm you know I'm when people say I'm sorry you lost your mother, I say well obviously me too, but I tell you she built so much into us mm, 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 that. It, you know, she she baked so much into us that she left it. She did not leave us uh, without, you know. And I know all my brothers feel that way. You know, we just she she her birthday is the same day as MLK Day. OK. January 15th. And um, so we all got together to celebrate her birthday. Right. And, uh, you know, we all just talked about how, you know, yeah, we're we miss her and we're sad, but we we don't feel she missed anything. And we don't feel that she left us without anything. There's like no regrets, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like, you know, I wish we'd have done it. No, no, we did it all, man. We we did it all. We had a good time. Our mom was the best. We were blessed by God to have her, right? And we remember her uh, every day. So she was the office and what administrator is teach us? for your dad? Well, yes, she was. Until his she stroke. Was. And she so was. I read about his stroke, and, and I didn't realize that he had survived it. But after his stroke, she went back at 57 years old and got her master's degree. Which is the same yeah. age you were when you were when you were fighting that for, for uh, Chauvin case? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And uh, so, and then she was doing. She got her master's in social work at fifty seven, and was doing it right up until a month before she, we lost her. Amazing juvenile and court. I she's fighting that, for kids I, in juvenile court. Is that was that her main? Right. Uh. That's that's exactly what she did. She did. She started out doing juvenile sex offender group. Mm. And she said, you know, the world scorns them, but I'm telling you, it's way more complicated than you think it is. Mm-hmm. And they're, they, yes, they are salvageable. Mm-hmm. And uh, because I'm with them every day and, 
Maybe some are not, but most are. And, you know, she she was a true advocate for those kids, you know. And when then she went on to just do juvenile offenders generally. And then she just started advising younger uh, uh, social workers in Wayne County. But she loved her work and she had done a lot of stuff on trauma. Mm-hmm. She had done research on trauma and how generational trauma can lead to, you know, uh, you know, mental illness and disease in future generations who didn't even experience, you know, the original trauma. And, um, you know, so my mom was really, really that person. You know, she was really that one who we had a wonderful memorial for her back in the um, fall. Mm. You know, that we had a point where it, everybody was kind of feeling hopeful about dealing with COVID. Mm-hmm. And then uh, now we're dealing with Omicron, Omni, Omicron, but, but, but before that really kind of swept in, we, we got together and, you know, safe and everything, masked up. But we got together in Detroit and gave her the uh, memorial that she did not get when she died. You know, only about um, a few of us were allowed to even go, you know. Hmm. You know, yeah, she's great, man. She and, passed uh, away at the very beginning of the pandemic in March right. of 2020. One month before yep. Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. And boy, she would had a lot to say about that. But I mean, you went straight into coordinating that case, you know, this landmark historical case that, I mean, I mean, we know that that's going to be there in American history with Brown versus Board Edge, Plessy versus Ferguson. I mean, that's, that's there with those cases because it's, it's such a historical, pivotal moment you know, in this long march for justice, freedom, and equality. But, I mean, you're going into that just a month after losing your mother, man. Yeah, but, you know, it's so funny, you know, I, um, so my mom, when I was in Congress, uh, you may remember that there was this ugly racial incident in Jenna, Louisiana. Yes, sir. And there was this group of kids called the Jenna Six. Yes. And my mom calls me because I'm on the Judiciary Committee and she says, well, you got your own Jenna story. I'm like, Mom, what are you talking about? She says, well, Grandpa Frank, your grandpa, he'd be driving through uh, and uh, Jenna and they would pull logs out and uh, would uh, interfere with the um, his ability to get up and down the road. And they were all worried that if they got out of the car, they get shot by a sniper. And if they didn't. What would they do? But, you know, they just drove over them trees. And sometimes they had trees stuck in the car by when they got home. But she gave me this story. And I tell you that now because, you know, it's like she was there straight up. It was really she really was present in everything we were doing. I know she would have felt like you get in there. You don't back down. We raised you to to do what you're doing. And now is the moment where we're looking for some delivery on our investment. And she talked like that, you know? <laughs> you know she's she, like, do you understand what we did for you? I raised five of you. Little <laughs> right. <jokers."> yeah. <laughs> right, right. She'd be like, look. Did your dad say that every you, all the boys had to either be doctors or lawyers? Well, he was tough like that. And you now, all are. I got to tell you. Yeah, we all are. And I will tell you this. my fa- That was my father's imagination right. for who he was. Mm, okay. And like... I'll never forget what my son Jeremiah goes to me. Dad, what? I'm not going back to Hamlin. I'm like, what do you mean? What do you, what do you I mean, are you, are you taking a semester? What are you, what are you talking about? I'm not going back. What, is this a gap year? <laughs> right, right. He goes, I'm, gonna, I'm an artist. I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to be a full-time artist. I got a contract. That's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, do you know how pissed off you're grandparents would be to hear this and he said yeah but what did they fight for other than me to have choices so my dad's concept was this is how you ensure economic freedom Mm -hmm. you get some kind of a professional degree and you know we did i i said to my kids you've got to first be a good person first and then if you want to pursue some professional thing, you can do that. But an artist is, a, is as important as a, as a doctor, is as important as an engineer, is as important as a, 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 a filmmaker. 
you know, one time my daughter looked like she was going to go into film, being a filmmaker. Mm. She then she goes to the. I Walker. remember that. Yeah, she. Yeah, we had an email exchange about that. <laughs> yeah, she and now you know. Let me tell you, she is a first year law student at University of Minnesota Law Allah School where Akbar. I went. Allah Akbar. So. So let me tell you, brother, I leave where she at. What happened is she goes to the walker. She doesn't like how it's being run. Uh -huh. She has critiques of, of the management and thinks that there's problems. Yeah. They start talking about a union. She starts organizing the union. They get a majority of the workers there to sign a card saying, I want a union because this is not fair. Mm -hmm. So she is in the very heart of the entire effort. And she comes to me and she says, well, Dad, what is this? NLRB thing. What is this National Labor Relations Act? Well, honey, uh, here it is. You should read it. Oh, man. Well, let me ask you this, this. Can they do this? Can they do... Next thing you know, she's like, I think I figured out what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she wants to be uh, a union side labor lawyer. I'm, I didn't tell her. Uh, she can't say, oh, my dad made me do this. No, hon, you made this choice. This is what you wanted to do. And you were on your own journey to figure it out. Yeah. I, I tell you this, as much as I appreciate, love, and respect, and understand why my dad was, be quite honest with you, somewhat rigid about us and what we had to do, um, I think that what he really wanted was us to have, he didn't want us to be in a position where somebody was going to mistreat us on the job, and that was his concept. He didn't want, he said, look, I worked in the factory, I worked in the foundry. Uh, if you're not getting cussed out and disrespected, you're working in 120 degree heat. And them strong back jobs are going away anyway. I want you to do something with your mind. That's the way my dad would talk. And so, you know, yeah, he insisted and he used everything from shame, blame, and intimidation to get us to do what he needed to do. Yeah. But and 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 but you know, but like like you said, we stand on the shoulder of giants, and my dad is one of those giants. Hmm. And we should be able to see further than the giant could see. Yes, right? Sir. Yeah. So that so so you know, with nothing but love and respect for my father, I was I kind of told my kids, first you got to be a good person. I don't care if you are the most rich lawyer the world has ever known. Mm -hmm. If you're a creep and a liar and a disrespecter of people, then that's not nothing I respect. You missed it. You missed the point. Yeah. Grateful and honored to be partnering with the Zakat Foundation. Zakat, Z-A-K-A-T, is a pillar in, in the religion of Islam and the life of Muslims that we share with all of the wisdom traditions and spiritual codes and systems and religions in the world of charity, of generosity, of giving back, of breaking our connection with the material realm so that we're not serving and living as slaves of the material life, but that we are uh, servants of our own values and principles and the things that we live by, you know, the people of integrity that can't be bought and sold, you know, like our, like I would say is true of our brother Keith that we're hearing from on this episode. So it's also understood in Islam that, you know, we seek to earn our income from means that we feel good about, you know, that, that reflect our values, but the nature of money, the nature of business, the nature of the human condition in the world is such that it's almost inevitable that our income is going to be tainted and mixed you know, with something that may be related to exploitation or something that we really don't believe in. So giving back is part of how we purify our income, whether it's a lot or a little bit. And Zakat Foundation has been operating in countries all over the world to help Muslims and non-Muslims to do that. Specifically, we're working with uh, Zakat Foundation's uh, orphan relief program. And I'm really honored to be doing so. Here's things I want to tell you right from the beginning. Number one, when you donate to Zakat Foundation orphan relief program, 100% of your donation goes to orphans and their families. They don't keep anything for admin. They don't keep anything for salaries. They don't do any of that. They have other uh, other fundraising that they do for those purposes, for their admin costs and their salaries. So, you know, so many of these things, like you give your money and how much of it actually reaches the people with this program is 100%. Second thing to know is that it's a Muslim-led organization, but they don't only serve Muslims. 
the, the people that donate are not only Muslim and they don't proselytize. One of the things that these programs do is a lot of times they go and do really good work, but then also they're trying to convince you and convert you to whatever their program is. That's not what Z- why Zakat Foundation is doing this. In Islam, it's our honor and our duty to serve humanity, so that's what they're doing. So that's enough of an Islamic reality for them. Another thing that's important to know is that Zakat Foundation has people on the ground making sure that the quality control is there for the ways that these, making sure that this stuff, that these resources get to the right people and also uh, that, it, that it enters their life and that the interaction with them is affirming of their humanity and, it, and, it, and is dignified and is respectful of, of the fact that you know, these human beings are not in this situation because they're not worthy. And the reality is that you know the the people that allow us to to play some small role in can, in in trying to help uh, uh, affirm and maintain the dignity of human beings they're actually doing us a service and so the way that they, they, these things are actually carried out is the details are are really important to Zakat Foundation but he, so all those are super dope here's where my sister my friend Amna Mirza who is you know this orphan relief program is her baby and she's becoming something like a rock star in the world of charitable giving because you know she's on the cover of LA Weekly she's on the cover of New York Weekly why in the in the orphan relief and support uh, industry for lack of a better term somebody decided somebody realized that like these are human hearts that we're appealing to. So if we show them pictures of orphan children, they're going to look at these babies and their hearts are going to melt and they're going to say, yes, I'll help. That's very beautiful. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. But what Amna had the foresight, the insight to realize and, and to, to think about is how often are people going to be choosing younger girls who are light-skinned? And how many older youth and how many boys and how many black kids are going to let, you know, go unserved if we let people choose just because of the nature, again, the reality of colonialism, of white supremacy, white standards of beauty, you know, the way that this stuff is even internalized by people who aren't white, the anti-blackness that exists in the world. And so she, she said she just wanted to look into it and she found that sure enough, you know, disproportionately younger, whiter girls were being chosen. So she flipped it and we were on a call and she was like, listen, this isn't Tinder. You're not shopping. This isn't internet shopping. You don't swipe left or swipe left, right on children and human beings that, that are honoring us by allowing us to participate in their, you know, in their care and in their relief and in serving them. So she said, we're going to make the default setting you can choose. Instead of seeing a picture, you see no pictures beforehand. After you start donating, then you see photos of the children and you hear of, and you learn about their education and their health care and what they're eating and their, the, the situation, their homes and all of these things about their life that's being enriched with that $50 donation that you give. But she said, our default setting is going to be one of two choices. One, you can say, I want this to go to whoever is in the most need and whoever has been waiting the longest. Or you can choose if you want to donate to a particular region. So some people just really want to donate to Somalia or to Syria or to Yemen or to Palestine. So it's like, you can do that. But the same way that that, that the, the pictures appeal to the hearts, also this decision, this choice started to appeal to the hearts. And people started saying like, oh, yeah, I do want to give to the people in most need. So... That's a very beautiful thing, you know, and it's, and it's groundbreaking. Uh, Zakat Foundation, uh, this charity for, or this relief program for orphan is operating in, I think, 15 countries, 14 or 15 countries. And their goal this year is to serve 10,000 orphans. Another dope thing about them is that they don't, they're not exclusive about who they consider to be orphans to children who both of their parents have passed away or are gone. If, if one of your parents died and the other one doesn't have the means or the skills or the wherewithal to support you, then you're, you're cared for in this program. Uh, I don't support stuff like this unless I know the people doing it and I can have real talk with them. You know what I'm saying? If, I, if, if there's something that's concerning, it, can I get this person on the phone or can I sit face to face and eye to eye with them and have real talk? And I know that they'll show up for that and they're not going to run away from it and they're not going to you know, back off. I met Amna because I was in a situation where I needed to have real talk with her 
uh, with this institution that I was performing with and that I saw like real problems with things. I said, hey, I need to talk to somebody about this. And she wasn't responsible for those things, but she took responsibility. And she actually no longer is at that institution. So it's like, these are the kind of people that I'm willing to step out with them. And I'm willing to share my platform and I'm happy to, to be partnering with them. So go to Zakat, Z-A-K-A-T dot org. Sign up, hit the, go to their orphan relief program. The donation is $50. And you can be as sure as possible that not only will the, the, the right children you know, that, that, that it will be equitable in the way that the funds are distributed. You know that there's people on the ground making sure that it's done properly. And you know that 100% of your donation goes directly to the people most in need. Very proud to be standing with the Zakat Foundation. Did you know that in Boston, there's a National Black Doll Museum and they have 7,000 dolls, some of them dating back to as far back as the late 1700s. So we're talking about the last century of American slavery. Um, this is a collection that was started not by people who were trying to start uh, a museum, but by two women that are elder women in our community now. But at the time that they started, they were young girls at the time in America where schools were being integrated and they were on the front lines. And if you know anything about that history, it's well documented that it was difficult in America across the country, but particularly in Massachusetts and particularly in the Boston area. These two little girls were part of integrating schools in Dorchester. And I'm saying there's video of the violence, the brutality, the terroristic threats, you know, and they were also dehumanized by their classmates, by parents, by people that worked at the school, and these girls even by their teacher. One of them describes raising her hand in class. They made her sit in the back, and he, she would raise her hand, and this man said horrible things. Her teacher said to her, I, I'll let you watch the video and check it out. It's launchgood.com slash black dolls. But she describes and recounts her story of being dehumanized. And so she went home and told her, her elders about it. And uh, I believe she said it was her auntie or her grandmother made her a doll right there on the spot with her bare hands and said, this is for you, made a black doll for her. And then she started collecting black dolls as a way of affirming and preserving her own humanity and sense of somebodyness, and then shared them with her children, her grandchildren, the community and generations to come. And they started this museum, but they had to close their doors because of the pandemic, like a lot of institutions did. So during this Black History Month, there's another month to go, or another week to go in this campaign. Uh, they're raising ten thousand dollars to, or, I'm sorry, a hundred thousand dollars to be able to open a museum to preserve this legacy, this living legacy of, you know, a, a, an affirmation of the shared humanity of us all, in the form of these black dolls, so that these can be preserved for us, for our children, our grandchildren, and for generations to come. So go to launchgood.com/blackdolls. Launchgood.com/blackdolls. Again. I don't come out here talking about these things unless I know the people that are involved in these campaigns. So I'm telling you from me to you that this is extremely legit and it's something that I think is extremely important and I'm very happy and grateful to be partnered with the National Black Doll Museum. I think it's super dope that upon launching this podcast, we're going to roll out on a tour. It's, I was on the road for 18 years and then had to stop for two years because of the pandemic. And now we get to come back. And not only do we have new music to share, we just dropped two new singles. We dropped one called Going Through It, produced by me and Ant, and another one called More Than This. And so we have new music to share. We got this new podcast. And so we're rolling out next month, just coming up in a couple weeks uh, in March and April on the West Coast of the Travelers Tour. This will be me, my amazing DJ, Last Word, super dope artist from the Twin Cities named Mally that matches our vibe and our intention, our message perfectly. Uh, we're going to start on the, on the West Coast. If you go to brotherali.com slash events, you'll see all the dates are there. But I wanted to let you know that we also have VIP packages. And the VIP package is dope because you get to get in the venue early. Uh, we do an intimate musical performance for you. And then we're basically going to do a live podcast with these small groups in the venue uh, with the people that get these VIP packages. You also get an exclusive shirt. Did I tell you that? Um, 
But so I'll come out and sometimes we'll have guests. So for example, in Madison, the guest for that one is my man Slug from Atmosphere. We'll come out and I'll be interviewing him and talking to him and we'll be taking your questions and things. Um, and then the highlights from that will become special episodes of the Travelers Podcast so that you can see these really amazing interactions that I have with the people that listen to and support our music. So head to brotherali.com, the events section, Get all of your tickets. All of the dates are there. Get those VIP packages and we'll see you soon. So that, that leads you from Wayne State University to University of Minnesota. That's when we finally get you. That's where we get together. And, and, uh, Absolutely. And then that's, that's where you're going to law school. And you were known as an activist on that campus. You yeah. set up the Coalition for Police Accountability and you put out a yep. newsletter called Cop Watch. Yep. Is that really yep. the beginning yep. of your like formal activism, organizing, you know, that the kind of formal part of your work? Probably probably is. Probably is. I mean, look, I'm, look. I just want to be clear to everybody who's listening. I think that it is that there are a lot of people who become police officers who do it honorably and well and treat people fairly and they protect people. My life's journey was my dad telling me uh, if you get stopped driving this car by a police officer, you put your hands on the wheel. You say, yes, sir. No, sir. This is no time for you to argue, you know, the finer points of, uh, of, of, of a constitutional stop, right? This is no time. Don't do it. You will get killed. And guess what? We probably won't be able to do nothing about it, right? So you... Don't mouth off, get smart, get through it. And then when, when we're out of there, then we'll deal with it, right? And that's what my dad would tell us. He told me that even before I started driving. He told me that. And when I started driving, I mean, he basically had his hand on my on my shirt, like, you listen to me. Because my dad comes from a generation where it was perfectly fine for you to put hands on your kids. Uh, I, you know, we're in another generation, right? But I mean, but he grabbed me and said, you Spare the rice, no, you spoil the child. It's a religious obligation <laughs> right, to right. beat that butt. <laughs> <laughs> right. And my dad was that that dude. And he said, and so I could my earliest orientation when like like my, like my grandpa, Frank, we were just talking about him. You know, it wasn't just the local citizens bothering him. It was him getting stopped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Frank, be a sad thing if that nice window you just put in your house got broke. You know, you over here stirring up a fuss trying to change things. You know, they've been this way. Why don't you leave it alone? Yeah. Right. It was a police saying this to him. Yeah. When John Lewis got beaten in the head by, it was police doing it mm -hmm. on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Mm -hmm. when, 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 when Martin Luther King got arrested 30 times, it was police doing it, mm -hmm. right? When, when, when Fred Hampton got shot down in Chicago, it, it was bad. a police coming through the door. So I don't blame all police no more than I blame bad doctors for doing bad medicine. Mm -hmm. but, I, but there's no way we can say that in the... Racial harmony, high, I mean, hierarchy of America mm -hmm. that was enforced by law, that police didn't play a role in it. They did. Yes, sir. There's, we don't get, we're not better off by denying that truth. We're, let's face that truth and just do better in the future. That's all we can really do. You know, one of your critics said one time, Keith Ellison prosecutes police, and you said, I don't prosecute police, I, pro I prosecute criminals. And you said, it was one of the dopest things I've ever heard anybody say on TV. You said, my role is to make sure that Derek Chauvin isn't above the law and George Floyd is not beneath it. Nobody's That's above right. the law. Nobody's beneath the law. You know, not because of your, your, you know, your racial identity or the, the piece of metal that's on your shirt. Uh, and somebody said, how do you that's decide it. who you're going to prosecute and who you're not? And you said, well, if they break the law, I go after them. And if they don't break the law, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, pretty simple, right? <laughs> Pretty easy to deal with. Here's the thing. Twelve Minnesotans who said that he was guilty. Yes, sir. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes, sir. After he had a full and free opportunity to put his case on. And then in the Dante Wright case, let's just be honest. She didn't know she had a gun in her hand. And she discharged it and killed somebody. And she trained now, others how to use their revolvers. And, and their tasers. She trained others on how to use the equipment. Right. So, so some people say it was, it was an accident. I say, yeah. And there's a lot of accidents that can become crimes. If I'm texting 
going through the intersection and hit somebody. Did I mean to hit him? No, but I did. And now I've got to manage those consequences and face them. You know, there's a lot of accidental behavior that you that, that, that the law does not permit you to engage in. Mm-hmm. It requires you to be more careful and not reckless. And that's just the way it is. And, you know, 12 people looked at her, her charges. She even testified. And they said guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And so that's what's going on. Both of them were fired, not even on a police department when I got, when they met me. Yes, sir. Now, you know, and, and so here's the thing. And you the didn't thing. fire them. I, I didn't fire mm-hmm. them. Uh, so I, I think that it is important uh, for our society to look um, at this issue, this issue of chronic negative interaction between police and, and communities of color and even white communities, quite frankly, uh, and, and, and just try to deal with it and solve it. I think that's the best way because, you know, how many judgments are we going to pay? Christine Rustek, white woman, shot and killed by a police officer. That's 20 million right there. George Floyd, 27 million. What if we stopped police misconduct? Mm-hmm. We'd save money. We'd put it into anything you want. Parking uh, parking lots downtown, playgrounds in the community. Education, health care, training, Education, get rid health. of the student debt, do all the things that the people are looking for. All of that, but we're paying out judgments in police misconduct. Yeah. And with George Floyd, the people got so incredibly frustrated. 500 buildings burned down on Lake Street. Yes, they did. And here's the thing. Some people are going to say, oh, that's a riot. That's illegal. But I'm like, look, we know that tragic incidents between police and community lead to civil unrest. Yes, sir. It's not because anybody wants it to happen or anybody thinks it should happen. It simply does happen. Like, look, day, then it's going to be night. You have an unaddressed problem. You're going to deal with civil unrest. It happened in Watts. It happened in Detroit. Yes, sir. It happened in every city. You could, Harlem. It Boston, happened in there's no everywhere. Chicago. Mm-hmm. Many. So this, this it's a pattern. So why don't we do something about it? And then I believe that the crime spike. And again, you know, we've seen statistics spiking up and there's no way I'm ever going to condone sticking a gun in somebody's face and saying, give me your car. That's just, that's immoral and wrong. And I can't ever say it's okay. But my point is, um, we know that when there are horrible incidents of police brutality, what happens is the community shrinks and withdraws from its trust of law enforcement, doesn't call them, doesn't engage them as much because of the trust deficit. Absolutely. And then people, and then people who would commit crimes, mm-hmm. They know that. Yes. And they're like, oh, we can get away with stuff we couldn't get away with before. The safest community is a community where there's a tr- where there's trust relationship, where there is a relationship. And so actually police brutality, I think, causes crime spikes or at least it has is it, at least is a factor. Right. And so it is in our interest to solve this problem. I'm for solving this problem. You know, and and it also really it, it creates a feeling of like where is the moral barometer in a country where your first interaction with the government that's you know on paper represents you is that paid officers of the state are harassing you. You know, your brother tells a story of 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 the two of you walking when you're young men. And it was a black cop, but I mean, this is still, you know, a, yeah. a, a, an officer still, of the they're, state. They're in the norm. They're operating within the norms of that institution. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, 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 no. But you know, yelling for you to stop, and he said, "I stopped." He said, "Keith paused," <laughs> and then he said that you and him had a very spirited debate, and uh, and and you all ended up going about your way. Yeah, yeah. I, so I remember that. I remember that occasion. So when you get to the University of Minnesota, you're doing this activism. Uh, what's your, so I'm, I'm just trying to do the math and I'm thinking like, this is maybe like the early eighties at this point, mid eighties. It would be mid eighties. I got to university of Minnesota, Minnesota at eight in 87, 87. So that's the golden right. age. So I have to ask about your relationship with hip hop because I, you know, Oh yeah. so, you know, I, I knew that a lot of your childhood was in the, in the seventies. But I'm wondering, like, yeah. what's what was your relationship with hip hop? When did it, you know, enter your life? And I remember being a sophomore in high school, 
when I think it was the Sugar Hill Gang released, um, you know, the chicken tastes like yes, wood. What, what you probably that's, know, you that's know that 1979. Thing, right? Well, so I th that's 79. Yes, sir. When it was wow, released, but it took time to make it around the country. It, it's not like it had national oh, distribution, yeah. but it, yeah, that, it came out in 79. Well, you know what? That makes sense to me because I graduated from high school in 81. Okay. So, so we were, I remember we were in football practice, which is like in August, doing double sessions. And we're all like listening to that. And the coach is turning it up because he's trying to get us to work a little harder. And... Um, and, I, and so that's really when hip hop sort of like hip hop and people debated, is this a fad? Is this going to what's going to happen with it? And then I don't know when it was, but but pretty soon, you know, the song by Wonder Mike mm -hmm. and my name is Wonder Mike. And I'd like to say hello. No, when was that one? I don't know. You probably same know. Oh, is that it's a long song? It's a long song. Yeah, same, then, same record. Yeah, but then the message yes, sir. comes out. And that's not the same song. No, that's sir. That's another. Yeah, that's Grandmaster Flash. Yeah. That's that's 81. Right. And then it, rap starts to be a little different. Yeah. But to me, it was it was speaking. It was it was cool. It was it was fun. It was uh it was totally danceable. And I do remember when, you know, it just seemed like it was harder to get into a band class, mm. quite frankly. Mm. It used to be you want to be in the band class, you could be in the band class. Then it got to be, well, we only got this number of seats. Well, maybe we're not going to have the program anymore. And it was seemed like right around that time that kids started, like, making music with records. Yes, sir. Because they wouldn't just play the record. They would go back, go forward, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, and so they got it created that way. So for me, it's a formative experience, hip-hop music. It is... Um, I remember the movie Breaking came out. Mm. Everybody loved that, you know, and you probably know the year on that one too. You're like you're like a rapologist, bro. Oh man, <laughs> student of the game. <laughs> yes, you are. But then the other one was I remember Chic. Uh -huh. Do 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 Chic Chic do 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 Chic, and that came out, and that sort of seemed like a big step forward, mm -hmm. right? And then rap is. Thoroughly arrived in my my mind, not not yours because you know this stuff so much better. But in my mind, rap is here to stay, and we always kind of I always kind of felt it was when Run DMC sort of becomes this band that's like rock okay, stars. this is not a fad. Yeah, like right, they're there they're with stars. all the rock star they're, bands. Right, they're crossing the charts. They're on. They did that song "Walk This Way" with um, Aerosmith. Aerosmith. And it's like, okay, so rap is not some deal over there. It's and then, you know, you begin and rap was so innovative. You begin to see sort of like like jazz influences in rap. Mm. You'd see, I mean, like even you, you you use a lot of horns and stuff. I mean oh, man. And, and you know you, I got I got I'm sorry, but I gotta speaking of horns. <laughs> yeah. In twenty twelve we played uh the the, yeah, the joint first ad for your reelection campaign. Yes, she did. And yes, I had did. a full horn section. And they used to do this like <laughs> New Orleans thing that I thought you would dig, where like the horn oh, yeah. section, we would end the song, my song called Take Me Home, and they would walk through the crowd. And so yep. the, the leader of the horn section, this Jewish brother named Jordan Katz, shout out Jordan Katz, was like, hey, Jordan. Congressman, do you want to do you want to walk with us? We're going to march through the crowd and like we'll be following you like this, like, you know, like this band following <laughs> yeah. you. And you were like, yeah, that's dope. Yeah. Let's do that. So we're walking. And then Shantae Palmer, who's this African-American brother playing the, the, the yeah. trombone. He's about six foot six. And so he's walking in front and he smacked you in the dome. <laughs> he hit you in the head with the trombone. Hey, man, on a live show, we didn't let, anything could happen. Right, man, we didn't let him live that down, man. I mean, the entire rest of the tour, we're like, man. He would say, like, you guys, I wonder, is it is it okay if I run over there and just grab a burrito from that stand real quick? And we'd be like, I mean, you did try to assassinate the congressman with your trauma. <laughs> <laughs> we have to factor this in. I mean, I, I don't know, man. It's hard. You know, it's hard. That's my friend, man. You smacked him in the head with it. It's the, deep, man. You know what I mean? Oh man. We had a wonderful night that night. That and I'm gonna fun. tell you who I met that mm. night. This is a this is an interesting tie-in talking about like weird happenings. There's a woman there whose name is Courtney Ross. I can mention her name because she was a witness in the case. Yeah. 
And Courtney was a friend of yours. She's a friend of mine. And Courtney, um, like on, on May 27th or 6th, 2020, calls me, Cave! Yeah, Courtney, what's up? Cave, they gonna, they gonna try to, they gonna try to ruin our boy. They, this is wrong, what they gonna do? I'm like, what are you talking about? George Floyd, that was my man, yeah. that was my partner. I'm like, wait a minute, Courtney, you telling me that the man who people are protesting in honor of, and then, you know, because of what happened to him, is your intimate partner. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to tell you, Keith. And you and I both know Courtney. So if you hear Courtney on the phone, person, you're right? like, this is a black woman from... <laughs> from <laughs> right, 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 right. Now, Courtney is a white woman from, from Northeast Minneapolis. Northeast, not even North she, Minneapolis, from Northeast. Yes, she is. I love Northeast, her to death, man. And, she, and she's a wonderful person with a very big heart. And she... I'm going to tell you, man, I was worried about how she was going to manage her testimony in the in the case because I was like, you know, you who could testify about the loss of their loved one, their intimate partner, their life partner, their fiance? Yeah. And 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 she got up there and she did really well. And she I th- I told her, I said, you know, there's a lot of people who help make the case and you're one of them. Absolutely. And, so you, you know, guys met at that show. Yeah. It's crazy because, you know, uh, Brother Keith, I heard about her. I heard like stories about her. All the time. She's like a mm-hmm. mythical Brother Ali fan, like biggest Brother Ali <laughs> fan in the world. Yeah, she and is. And so people would she come you, and be like, the lady that runs my coffee shop and her son are your biggest fans <laughs> in the world. They wear your T-shirts. Right. They won't play anything else on the, on the, on the thing. And so I, I heard about her for years. And, and we had met and things like that. Um, yeah. and, but then after Floyd was killed... Uh, I started seeing protests and I, st- I was seeing a family at the head of the protest all in Brother Ali shirts. And so yeah. I was like, man, I got to figure out who these guys are. So my uh, dear friend, Mike Madsen, who is an MC Madsen from the Unknown Prophet he, and, a, and a great photographer, he hit me up and he's like a, a, a really well-known like Northeast guy. And he hit me up and he yeah. said, hey, the, so Floyd's fiance was the lady that I've been telling you about. So that's yeah. really when our friendship formed. But I mean, she's traveled all over the country seeing our show. So you met her that night. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, now she will tell you. Mm. Let me tell you this. She would say, "Oh, you came into the coffee shop one time, and I was talking to you." Mm. And I'm like, "Ooh, I'm embarrassed. I don't remember that." But where where she came clear was like, she came to the show because she wanted to see you. Mm. And 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 I'm like, this is great. This is why we do this. Mm. You know using the attractive power of music, mm-hmm. hip hop, to pull people into a political process. And uh but she and I met there, been friends ever since. You know, she invited me to go talk to the kids at Edison because she had a gig over there too. And uh yeah, that's her. About a year ago when we moved to Istanbul, it was the it's very rare that it snows here. And I was going over, I live on the Asian side, you know, it split the water, like the Bosphorus sure. splits the Asian side and the European side. Oh, yeah, side. the Bosphorus, sure. So uh, we live on the Asian side, um, but I'm a like coffee fanatic. Like I'm, it's a problem, yeah. you yeah. know what I mean? So I'm, <laughs> I'm in an Uber going to the European side to buy this like $300 coffee grinder because it's got very specific settings and blah, blah, blah. Right, so right, I'm right, like, right. I'm in the Uber and... Um, man. So the they're they're playing the radio, and he's like the Uber driver speaks English, which is rare in Istanbul. And her trial, her her testimony was on the radio, you know. Mm. And so you know we're driving, and I'm looking out the window because I'm like, oh, it's snowy. It reminds me of home. It reminds me of Minneapolis. First time seeing snow, and I'm hearing her testify. And I'm sitting there and like my face is just covered in tears. And he turns around and he's like, are you okay? What's wrong? Something wrong? Do you need, you know, whatever? And I said, man, I know her. And they're talking mm. about my neighborhood, you know? And I said, mm. and, and then the Turkish reporter comes on and I hear him talking about the case. And da, 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 Minneapolis, da, 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 George Floyd. And he says, uh, da, 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 Keith Ellison. American Muslim man, like American Muslim Keith Ellison is heading this case. And I said, man, it's just, it's just one of those moments that I probably will never forget, you know? <laughs> you're like, I know the I'm just like, I know all these people. Because I'm trying to like tell the person, like, <laughs> right. I know all these people, you know what I mean? 
right, and, uh, right, right, right. And so, you know, we get over there and he stopped and he was just like, are you okay? And the Turks are very, like men show affection to other men in this culture. James sure, Baldwin sure. lived here for 10 years as a gay man in the 60s and 70s. I did not know Off and know on that. for 10 years. He, I thought he was in France. Yeah. They talk about France all the time. We know why. But he spent a lot of time yeah. here. And he was like, man, I've yeah. never been, I've never felt more just left alone to be myself as much as I did in mm. Istanbul. Um, and sure. so he was like, the man like came out and opened my door and, and was like rubbing my back. And he was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah. And he said, in your country, the police shoot the people? And I said, yeah, man. And he was like, yeah. the, the, he was like you know, I'm, I'm sorry that happened. And I said, man, but it happens all the time. Like it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a rare occasion. And he said, they, they've been doing this for like 10 years. I said, man, they've been doing it for 450 years, man. Like this yeah. has been going on for and he couldn't conceive of that. Yeah, it's just well, you know, if I, if I could share this with you, brother, um, I asked one of my staff members, a uh, brother named uh, Keon, great young man, mm -hmm. to pull all of the international representations of George Floyd, right? And we, we ended up to the point where we couldn't keep count. Mm -hmm. They were in Isfahan, Iran. They were in um, Portugal uh, uh, in, uh, and in um, Lisbon. They were in uh, all, over, all over Spain, uh, you know, in, in Medellin. They were in Bogota. They were in Cartagena. They were in uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Palestine. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Palestine, Palestine was in the street. Oh, yeah. They, were, they, were, they didn't even... They protested. Yeah, and, they've been in and, the street, like, But, like, also... Yeah, well, yeah, but they're like, yep, and here's another reason. But they were in Berchtesgaden, Munich, Berlin, mm -hmm. London, Cardiff. And they, they were, it was really all over the world. And it reminded me, in, you know, of, you know, when, you know, I don't know if you remember uh, when the, the um, Tiananmen Square, there's this iconic picture of this one guy standing in front of all these tanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course. that image sort of shot around the world and was sort of emblematic of, you know, the, 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 the one person standing up against the awesome power of the state. And this George Floyd photo really, really did that. You know, there's this place, maybe here's a place you and I would love, I'd love to go with you. It's called Comuna Trece in Medellin, Colombia. And it's this neighborhood that used to be the target of tremendous abuse. I mean, first of all, it was full of displaced people. Other than Syria, Colombia has more displaced people than any other country in the world. These people left their homes where they were thrown out of so somebody could build a gold mine. And, and they lived on like the mountain side uh, in, in, in Medellin and they didn't have water, they didn't have electricity, they didn't have nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's when the FARC and the, all these uh, you know, revolutionary groups would sort of be okay. there. Then the government would come there and try to kill them and end up with a lot of casualties who had nothing to do with it. So there's this history of struggle there. Now this community has used art, brother. They've used art to start painting and talking about their struggle, talking about their story, talking about what they went through. And the, and, and the tourists come to Comuna Trece, Community 13, and now they've got commerce and they've got a little bit of prosperity more than they used to have because they were able to convert this into this thing. Now the government supports it, which is, you know, government's always Johnny come lately on this right. stuff. But, you know... <laughs> yeah. um, but that's sort of that phenomenon. I, I wonder, you know, you know, maybe you and I should go there one day uh, to just because it's a com beautiful combination of art, hip hop, and 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 uh, and uh, fine arts. Uh, carry your bags and shine your shoes, man. Hey, well, hey, man, let's make a date, man. Let's, you know, we'll have a great time. I'll cancel my birthday. Thank let's go. Well, you know what? Uh, I can't probably get there until after the election, which is in November. Mm. I'm gonna be here on the grind. Mm. But after that, maybe we could we could go and you know they they are doing, I mean you you see all the hip you see all the um the the art on the wall, but then you see every every few blocks people rapping and and break dance. Yeah, yeah, they got called a, Comuna Trece. Comuna yeah. Trece. Community thirteen. You know, speaking of which, so you're you're a, a college student in '87 at U of M. Yep. Hip hop is cracking. Yep. In '87, Big oh, Daddy yeah. Kane sampled the Minister. 
out of the mercy of Allah <laughs> and Allah written in our nature, we call an individual into existence. And Big Daddy Kane has yeah. become a friend of mine. You know, I, it was really amazing. Like we, He's we, a great we've one. done shows and stuff in Europe. And one time I finished my set at, on, on the small stage and he's on the big stage on the other side. And so I asked somebody like, please, I need a golf cart. I got to go watch Kane. And so I get in the golf cart and I'm driving across and I just hear Minister Farrakhan's voice echoing across the, <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, Chuck D around yeah. that, in that same year, 87, Farrakhan's a prophet that I think you ought to listen to. What he can say to you, yeah. what you ought to do is follow for now. Power to people say. <laughs> so this is around the time, like, so when did you actually become a Muslim? Like what age was that? What well, year was, was that? A, was that? I became a Muslim in under the in a masjid in Detroit, Michigan, okay. uh, and it must have been 1982. The person who you know did my shahada is a good friend of mine now. He's getting up in age. His name's Ad Abdullah Bay Al Amin. All these brothers were, you know, following the you know teaching of uh, Warith D. Muhammad. Mm. And it, you know, and we were, you know, we were doing salat. We were reading the Quran. We're, you know, for us, there's no God but God. Muhammad is his messenger. We mean Muhammad ibn Abdullah yes, of, you know. And so, and so, but those guys, all the people who taught me Islam in Detroit were from that movement, uh -huh. right? And, and so that was my experience when I got to Detroit. I'm not Detroit. When I got to Minnesota in 87, you know, I'd been a Muslim for five, six years, you know, um, and then I run into Matthew Ramadan. Mm -hmm. First of all, I ran to the folks on campus. Okay. But then I ran into Matthew Ramadan and Matthew and I got to be friends. And then um, we and then, you know, our mutual very good friend, uh, his dad was the masjid. Charles Elamine mm -hmm. was the was the imam at her. the masjid. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, then next thing you know, Macram is leading the community mm -hmm. and. You know, and, and you and I were there around that, you know, during that time. Uh, but, you know, I always thought that as leaving outside religion, I always was intrigued by moving the people, right? Mm -hmm. well, you need a message that's going to move the people. The people don't move, then they won't. I mean, I believe that if you don't have agitation, you're not going to have social change, right? And, you know, clearly that movement led uh was 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 had was a movement demanding rights respect and all those things i um you know have my difference of opinions you know uh with with minister Farrakhan. Yes, um i don't want to i don't need to explore no need. those yeah, here no need to do that but but I, but i will say um you can't then no fair minded person can say that that organization not the individual but the organization Cleaned a lot of people up out of their life uh, of drugs. Cleaned a lot of people. Got a lot of people uh, up, standing upright, doing straight, somewhere to come out of prison. And that's something that the the, re the rest of the country didn't care what happened right. to these folks. That's right. And uh, and so you know, there's that. Um, but you know, I do believe that in our world, there's room for a lot of different ways to be, a lot of different ways to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always going to be one. I'm personally going to be one who says. I don't because I come from an oppressed community. I'm not going to I'm not going to heap oppression on anybody yes, else. Sir. So I don't care what you, your religion is yours. I respect that who you want to love and be with. That's you. I'm never going to be the guy who's like. Yeah, I, you're you're bad for what who you are and what you do. Yes. And and so I can't get down like that. But I will say um, peace to him. Right. And I uh, hope things thrive, grow and whatever. You know, and I hope people do get closer to what Islam's about. The fourth chapter of the Quran, 135th verse, is like the the verse about justice. You know, and it and, yeah. it, and it hangs. It's you know, it's inscribed in you know Harvard Law School, and it's it's all over the world. Like that, that's like you know the verse. And and the the Islamic tradition talks about fairness and equity and justice and you know so much of what uh, of what the tradition is about is based on that but this particular uh verse i was just thinking about it with relation to you know to your work allah says mm -hmm. oh you who believe stand out firmly for justice as, as for justice as witnesses to god even mm -hmm. if it's against yourself even if it's against yep. your parents even if it's against your own people whether rich or poor, Allah is the one that's taking, that's looking after both. 
and don't follow the biases of your own heart because your right. biases can make you swerve from justice. And Allah says, if you distort justice or if you decline to do justice, Allah is well aware of what you do. M mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> so saith the Lord. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, you know, and, and, and it's one of those surahs that is, 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 it just, it just helps you, you, it's like a compass. Mm -hmm. It's like, right. And, and it's like, look, even though against your own selves your own or your soul. parents or Nefsukum, your even against your, yeah. your own, your, even against your own soul, you tell the truth and yeah. do what's right. Even if you're speaking against yourself. Yeah. Or your people. Yeah. Or your nearest kin. Mm -hmm. What is that? I mean, that that is that takes profound faith. I don't even know if courage is adequate. Mm -hmm. You might there might not be enough courage to do that, mm -hmm. but there's certainly enough faith, right? And it takes great faith, you know, because I tell you one thing, it's it it, it it's easier to fight against somebody who you consider an opponent. Mm -hmm. Then to go to your own and say, we got this wrong, guys. Yes. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's, hard, it's, it's harder to go to your own people who love and nurture you and say, we, we, we got this wrong, guys. We're not, we're not doing it. We're not going to, we're not, I can't abide by that. Mm -hmm. That I mean, It's so much easier to say, and those bad guys, and da 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 and da 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 And it's like, e it's actually literally easier to be this sort of like, advocate for a cause that you're ensconced in. Mm. But when you got to go to your own people and you got to say, uh, we're not doing this right. We got to go a different direction. Yeah. It is, it is emotionally difficult, you know, it's what, but yet it's what God requires. It's, it's so amazing that specifically in black Islam, because, you know, those of us yep. that are Muslim in America know that there's a deep, rich history and tradition of black Islam that goes back really even before Columbus came, before the Europeans came. Yeah. You know, we, yep. we, we yep. know a lot about Mansa Musa, Mansa Khan Khan Musa, yeah. his brother, Mansa, Mansa Khan Khan Abu Bakr. Uh, you know, their family was extremely wealthy. They were the rulers of Mali and they brought thousands of ships from West Africa to the shores of what's now known as America long before Europeans mm. were ever there. And there's this long and, and really rich and amazing history of black Islam, uh, you know, that, that picks back up with noble Drew Ali and the honorable Elijah Muhammad and Imam yep. Worthy Muhammad and, you know, hip hop music is, is all tied together. But when people, you know, talk about the Muslims as though we're the harshest critics of America, the, the most famous and powerful black Muslim leaders have also, I mean, talking about internal community, uh, you know, the, the, yeah. the need to do better, the need to improve, the need to do right by one another, the need to like, even if you look in the writings of what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was teaching, like don't smoke, don't drink. Sure. If you have a job, show right. up on your job on time and be clean and, and, and make sure that you give a, yeah. you know, and don't lie and don't lie to anybody and don't cheat anybody. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing that this tradition is one that... And what's, so, what's incredible is that post 9-11, one of the stories that you know is true that's not being covered is the, uh, the number of European, American, Caucasian people that convert to Islam every day in, this, in, oh, in America. Oh, it's common. Yeah, it's... it's and, and they convert I, both it's because like, they see the possibility for transformation, but also it's like... You know, these are people who can speak eloquently and passionately about about you know challenging white supremacy in themselves and yeah. in, and in and in the world around them. So many people like me. I, you know, I came because I read Malcolm X. I met KRS One yeah. when I was thirteen, and he told me you need to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. So I read it, and then the movie came out. Spike's wow. movie came out, and my mom thought I was crazy, and so she brought me to Matthew Ramadan. And, and Matthew Ramadan said, just, just bring him to me. My mom called the messenger to her when it, we were in a little house on, on Broadway, on uh, Bryant. She called him up and she was like, my son's crazy. <laughs> he thinks he's a Muslim. <laughs> and so Imam <laughs> Ramadan was like, just bring him here. Just, we, we got this, drop him off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so, you know, but 
this incredible legacy is something that's so important, man. So it is, but you know, you're right. You're so right about that. I mean, you know, I tell you this: there's a lot of people in the Latino community who are absolutely fastest section growing, uh, fastest growing yeah, section of our I mean, community. Yeah, and so you know, it's it, it, and again, you and I both know that the early Sahaba were a multicultural group. Yeah, yes, they they were not, and you know, and actually, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had to say to all of us, uh, you know. Arabs not better than the non-Arabs, and non-Arabs not better than Arabs, and whites not better than the black, blacks not better than the white. He's the best among you is the one who's most uh, faithful and, to and your faith. Absolutely, right? And and yeah. that is the first public record of a person making an anti-racist statement on a public platform. This is the first human hmm. being in recorded history to have said that, and that's his final speech. That's that, it. That's his final sermon. The Travelers Podcast is sponsored by Vice Gerent, makers and merchants of fine men's tailored clothing. The same way that you have to eat, you got to eat food. It's not a question of whether or not you're going to eat. It's a question of what you're going to eat and is it going to be intentional or not? Is it going to be beautiful or not? Uh, the great poet and writer Khalil Gibran said, a human being can't eat anything without killing something, without taking the life of something. Even vegans, vegetarians, you know what I'm saying? The, those vegetables, those are living things. And we're taking their life so that we can sustain our own. And so Khalil Gibran said, and, and really all of the wisdom traditions and spiritual traditions hold this, the traditional ones especially, that eating should be a sacred practice. It should be a meditative practice. It should be a ceremony. It should be something that becomes, uh, you know, and the intention is what changes that. So the same way that we can just go to the grocery store and buy whatever, but somebody, those things are not going to be sustainable. Somebody probably got exploited along the way for it to be cheap. Why can I walk into a grocery store at any time of the year and expect that there's, you know, if I live in Minnesota, why are there fresh mangoes in, in December? How did that happen? Because something unsustainable, unnatural, and unhuman happened, unhumane happened for that to be the reality. You know what I'm saying? Whereas if I if I go out of my way to 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 deal with locally grown and locally sourced food that's free range, that's organic, you know what I'm saying? That's that's local. I might be paying a little bit more, but it's going to be better for my body. It's going to be better for my community. And ultimately, that shift in intention changes something that's mundane that I do every day. It takes it from something that's harmful and thoughtless into something that's actually beautiful and meaningful. And if I'm going to be eating like that... so. The same is true with the clothes that we wear. You know, uh, working with a tailor like Vice Gerent, like my man Usman the tailor, Usman Aslam in Chicago. You know, this isn't about being a hipster. It's not about being a diva. It's not about being a narcissist. It's not about everybody look at me. I'm so fly. I'm so much flyer than y'all. It's about taking the reality that we're going to wear clothes every day and actually making it worship, actually making it. Uh, an, an act of good that we do in the world. Like, what does it mean to get up every day and like, I believe in all these things and I'm fighting for justice, I'm speaking out, I'm organizing, I'm, you know, I'm serving people, I'm doing all, whatever it is that we do. And then we put on clothes that are made by, in sweatshops by children that are not paid livable wages and in many cases people are committing suicide. And then that thing isn't made for me. What's the intention it's made for? What's the energy that I'm putting on my body when I wear that stuff? You know what I'm saying? And then when I go to the, and then, you know, and then when I'm done with it, maybe it doesn't last very long. And even if I donate it, most of the clothes we donate end up in landfills. So you sit with Usman the tailor, and the, the difference is that he's talking to you about what's the energy and the intention that I want to have when I'm inside my clothes. How do I want to feel? What's the energy that I want to be bringing to situations? How do I want to make people feel? You know, the same way you set the tone with, Lighting and, and scent and sound and music and the, the temperature and all this kind of stuff. What's the energy I want to put in the world? Because the way that I show up is going gonna, is gonna to absolutely affect that. So 
you know, I know it's a bit more expensive. I know it's, a, you know, going out of the way a little bit to do something like that. But trust me when I tell you that when, when you put on clothes that were made for you with the intention of being sustainable, with the intention that nobody's being exploited, with the intention that this is something that's, that's beautifying your, your every moment and your every interaction and it's taking something that was mundane and thoughtless and turning it into something that's sacred, turning it into something that's, that's a force of good in the world. It's not the same. It's different. I'm telling you, it's different. So head to Vice Gerent. Check out their, their feed on social media and on Instagram and their website and all of that good stuff. And uh, tell my brother Osman that Brother Ali sent you. And uh, Osman is somebody that I love, and his service is one that I've cherished in my life. So we're happy to be joined by Vice Chairman Official. Traveler's Podcast is brought to you by UPF, Unity Productions Foundation. Unity Productions is a collective of creatives uh, that come together to do really amazing things, really great cultural production. But specifically, we're partnering with them on Unfold Your Own Myth, which is a program where they bring together writers, authors, songwriters, poets, uh, storytellers to, to create uh, online workshop that teaches and helps and facilitates uh, young people learn to tell their own stories, to, to explore themselves and express themselves, which is extremely important. Because one of the things that it does is that, you, you know, the idea that, that my story deserves to be heard and deserves to be told, you know, is a really a affirmation of humanity itself. And it's a, it's a very important thing. And a lot of the people, a lot of the children, a lot of the youth that have participated in this program as participants, I mean, they're dealing with people in Afghanistan that come from war zones where people are saying like, you know, you, you're just people that we read about in the newspaper. You're just numbers. You're just numbers on somebody's, you know, collateral damage report. But this unfold your own myth is it basically says to them, no, you are a unique human being that was brought into the world by the unseen divine creator of all things and, and, the, and that God doesn't repeat himself in creating. So your story matters and, and you deserve to know yourself and you deserve to express yourself. That story matters enough to be written down and for that process to be honored, but that also... There are other people that need to know what you have. You have a part of this. It's really in line with the, with the purpose and the intention of this podcast, that like your story matters to people because no one has your story but you, but there's other people out there that need to hear what you've been through just so they know they've not, that they're not alone and that they can benefit from the wisdom that you've gleaned. So if you go to upf.tv slash unfold, um, you know, you can access these, you can support them and please do that, but you can also access this, this online workshop. And so if you're a community leader, if you're an organizer, if you're an educator, if you work with youth, if you work with bringing people together in any kind of way, you can access this. And I'm one of the presenters. I'm, I'm honored and blessed and fortunate to be one of the presenters. And I'm really happy to have them as partners and sponsors on this podcast. UPF Unfold Your Own Myth, upf.tv slash unfold. You know, it's really important that we remain independent. That's something that's extremely important to me. But why is that the case? Because, you know, in our exploring and expressing ourselves, in the stories that we tell, the things that we choose to prioritize and focus, uh, focus on, it's important to be independent because there are needs associated with creating these things and with living life. So, you know, we, we need to figure out a way to make the things that we offer the world sustainable, you know, and so these resources have to come from somewhere. When I came into the music game or whatever it is, the practice of, of, of being a musician full time, we had this idea that we wanted to be independent. And what we would say at that time is like, we don't want corporate money. We don't want to be on major record labels because, and we don't want corporate sponsors because of the fact that a corporation is just there to make money and they don't care how they do it or who they hurt to do it. That's not what's important to them. It's a group of people that come together with one purpose. We're going to make money, increase the bottom line. And so when those become your benefactors, 
there's always something going on somewhere deep down inside that says, you know, if I if I talk about these things, then this is going to lead to more uh, support. If I if I if I shape it this way, this is probably going to mean less support for me. And ultimately, it may lead to the downfall of me trying to practice what I what I love and offer what I have to the world. You know, when I started out, we did this song called Uncle Sam Goddamn, and I was supposed to roll out on tour with uh, on a tour that w- had a big corporate sponsorship it was a major cell phone company and you know i was all set to roll out on this tour uncle sam goddamn came out on an independent record label on rhyme Sayers entertainment and rhyme Sayers never tried to tell me what to say in fact they just wanted is it true to you is it authentic is this which is this really what's in your heart and then is it dope music you know uh sadiq at rhyme Sayers, actually i gave him undisputed truth album and he said man this uncle sam goddamn should be the first single and it's the first one that he ever invested money to make a video for. So it's like, okay, that's, that's independent, right? So then we put it out. They weren't airing it a whole lot on TV, but it was one of the first videos, independent videos on YouTube was a brand new platform. And it was re- getting millions of, of views. So I'm supposed to be on this tour, though, that's sponsored by this cell phone man- company. And you know, at that time, one of their other tours had some other people on it that came under fire, under scrutiny, and Fox News went after them. Why are you sponsoring this? So they went through all their tours with a fine-tooth comb and said, anything that Fox News might be able to dig up, we got to drop it. So they dropped me from the tour. You know, and so that's at that time when we first came in the game, that's what it meant to be independent and to not sell out to corporations. Here's what it looks like now. So now... I'm in this world of social media. I'm in this world of content creation and curation. And we're on YouTube doing a podcast. And I know that if you watch like The Social Dilemma, really, I I can't recommend it more highly, this uh, documentary. These are corporations. These, these, uh, you know, these uh, outlets, these platforms are corporate entities, but then also they advertise corporate entities. It's very, they just want to get eyes on their platform so that they can sell you stuff and so that they can mine your data and all these things that they do. But the, the number one way to do that is to fuel argument and controversy and debate. And the way that that's, that that's operating in society is that it's driving division and wedges between people. I got no shortage of opinions. A lot of them are controversial and, I, and I've sacrificed a lot to stand up for what I believe in and for, to say what I believe is true. But the reality is that you know, you could start playing games with this, trying to trying to work the algorithm and trying to make the, you know, I just heard uh, my man Open Mike Eagle say, make the machines like us. You know what I'm saying? But those machines are by, by, by you know, they got, they're backed by major corporations with a lot of money. And so if you fuel argumentation, if you fuel division between people, if you post things that are provocative and that you know are going to cause arguments and be clickbait, then that's another way. But look what that does to us. Look what that does to the way that we create. I'm, why am I saying all this? I'm saying this because we have a, a platform uh, called that we call our caravan. It's, it's something similar to Patreon, but it's a different format. It's a different platform that suits our needs and the things that we want to do with it. And we have different uh, tiers. And the idea is to really foster and build community. I used to go on tour and the people would come and we try to keep our ticket prices low for tours. So you come and pay 20 bucks. And if you get 500 people doing that, well, now I got enough money to live and do what I want to do. And I don't have to ask whatever corporation, you know, can I please have some money to go do what I do what I'm doing? I can just rely on the people that support it, the people that actually listen to the music. And then also those people started to form a community around that. And so I've I've learned that those shows and those tours aren't as reliable as they used to be, but also we can go into these these platforms and this technology with the intention of being sincere, being independent, and building and fostering connection, if not community. And so that's what the caravan is. If you go to brotherali.com to the section called join, you'll see there's different tiers there. The first one is that you contribute five bucks a month and a little bit with a lot of people goes a long way into covering our costs and keeping us independent and also keeping the show free. You know, the, 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 the show itself will still be published everywhere and it'll be free. Uh, but 
you know, and for that you get these episodes early and you also get them without these ad breaks. So you don't have to hear an extra hour of me talking about all this stuff. I think it's dope because we choose sponsors that we know and love, but you can get them without that. The second tier, you, you contribute a little bit more. Um, you get access to an Ask Me Anything episode of the podcast uh, monthly that, you know, I start going through questions that are asked of me. You know what I'm saying? So you get to be contribute to episodes of the podcast that are just for, for, for that group of people. You also get uh, digital gift, gift boxes, gift packages. So things that we create that we don't intend for everybody, but we want for the people that really support us, that are dialed in, people like you that understand, that really get what we're doing. We want to share those things with you. And then also you get uh, a one-hour recording of the oral history of Rites of Passage, my demo tape. That I, that I brought to Rhyme Sayers. And uh, the third tier is a commitment. It's an investment. It's 100 bucks. Uh, and that one gets you all of those things that I mentioned before, but also there's a private Slack channel. And we keep it intimate so that there can actually be a sense and a fostering of a connection and a communal element to it. And so in that one, you know, I leave voice notes, I love voice notes, and there are people from different walks of life and, you know, different backgrounds that that are, are joining together. And what I'm seeing start to unfold is that people are starting to share wisdom with each other. They're starting to share what they're going through. People are starting to hear from each other. So I contribute in that, but it's not just me in there. It's also a community of people that we call our caravan. All that being said, the podcast is free and the podcast will stay free and it'll stay public and we'll post it in all these places where you can get it, you know what I'm saying, for free. But for the people that want to be part of this and want to make sure that, it's, that it remains free, that it remains not only free money-wise, but free in the heart and free in the mind and free in content, uh, head to brotherali.com in the section called Join and get down with this caravan. We thank you very much. When you, when you were sworn into Congress, everyone oh, yeah. swears on, puts their hand on the Bible, and you said that you wanted to be sworn in on the Quran, but not only the Quran, but that uh, uh, that um, Sale, uh, what's his name, uh, the George Sale Quran that was in yeah. the possession and in the library of Thomas Jefferson. That's and right. Thomas Jefferson has this really amazing. So there's a book that just came out called Jefferson's Muslim Fugitives, where is that yes, right? sir. I didn't even no, know. No, it's about dope, it. man. It's amazing. It's this is new <laughs> stuff that was just recently uncovered, where Jefferson received uh, a beautifully written Arabic letter from West Africans who had been wrongfully enslaved in America, and he actually assisted wow. them. You know what I mean? Oh, so the, wow. this connection That's between deep. West African Islam and, the, and then, the, you know, enslaved Africans and their children and the fight for justice and also the cultural tradition. So, you know, the fact that you were sworn in, the, just the symbolic uh, importance of that in the, in the narrative of what America is, you know, yeah. you know. But what is it... What does it feel like to be connected in that way to Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> like, how do you, you, know, how do you, you feel know, about that? Honestly, I think that Thomas Jefferson is a fascinating person, very complicated guy, mm -hmm. right? Very complicated guy. Um, Thomas Jefferson uh, spoke not only in the only not only as an owner of a Quran, but he actually spoke about religious t tolerance and. In and that was critical. Mm -hmm. You know, on the other hand, he's a human being. So what does that mean? He's like, I know that holding slaves is wrong, but it makes me a lot of money and I don't know what to do about it. But I don't really like I mean, cooking he, that much. And these, <laughs> these, these, these crops aren't really right, going right, to take care right. of themselves. And uh. Right. Somebody got it. Right. And, and he, you know, the thing is, you know, he, he has this quote, goes something like this. I tremble when I know that God is just and his justice will not sleep forever. He was talking about slavery. Yes, sir. Yeah. And yet at the same time, he was like, Ugh. I mean, it's like America was addicted to slavery, right? It couldn't quit, right? And we probably needed a war to end it because some folks was never letting it go. Um, but he's a complicated figure. And I put it like this. I think it is important to recognize the contribution of Thomas Jefferson without... Uh, I mean, some people say, well, he held slaves, so he's just bad. I'm like, well, that's one way to see it. 
<laughs> you know, I don't, I, I think it's, I think we've got to be a little more nuanced than that, right? I don't think Thomas Jefferson and say um, uh, Robert E. Lee are the, are the same. Mm. Robert E. Lee led a war to kill and die to maintain the slave yeah. That He's a traitor to, you know, that's another thing. Thomas Jefferson, sadly, didn't have the strength of character to um, buck the prevailing notions of liberty at the time he was living. But he did know, he was aware that there were notions of liberty that surpassed his moment in time. And, and so I think he's an interesting guy. Um, you know, he, 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 he wrote uh, notes on Virginia. Um, I think that people make a mistake when they think that America started with the Boston Tea Party. The concept of America really is, is starts in Virginia, mm. you know, in my reading. Mm. And uh, actually, um, in Thomas Jefferson's notes in Virginia, might, he might have been, you know, in many ways, um, the, the intellectual leader of what the country eventually became. There were others as well. I mean, I mean, you know, we all know about, you know, Alexander Hamilton. And, but, that was, but, but at the time, it's important to understand, we didn't have the, a United States. We had states that were kind of, kind of united, you know. And, and so there were very different factions and ways of looking at the world. So that's what I think about Thomas Jefferson. I'm, not, I'm no big fan of him. I'm no harsh critic of him. We, we, take, we take what we can benefit from, and then we understand that if you want to lionize somebody and make them into some sort of a demigod, probably not true. I mean, you know, uh, but at the same time, there are things we can learn and draw and should draw from Thomas Jefferson. You know, being somebody that was, you know, doing such incredible activist work, like you did, you know, everything from street level, super grassroots activism, um, you know, and all these different uh, areas of activism and organizing and advocacy and speaking and writing and creating coalitions. There's this feeling among, you know, because I did more like street level, grassroots level stuff. There's this feeling sometimes among those communities, especially, you know, among certain factions that like to go into the system and to actually like leave this position and to actually go inside of the system. There's this idea that like you go in there saying that you're going to change the system and they're actually going to be the ones to change you. And yeah. honestly, I've seen that happen over and over and over again. You know, a lot sure. of the people that, that were really powerful and outspoken in the 60s and 70s, they got good jobs. And Peter Ustinov, I think it was, or, or maybe it was, uh, I think it, maybe it was, uh, Allah must I say my man, who's the great, uh, Saul Alinsky. I think it was actually him said, yeah. you know, uh, uh, affluence makes cowards of us all. You know, um, and, but and he was known for really like believing in the worst of people of the human condition. Like he, yeah. he said, well, you can count on that. You can't count on somebody's yeah. altruism. You can count on their interests, though. But you know, of yeah. all the people that I've known that have that have taken that approach, you are the person that I can say that not only because I know you, but just everything that I've seen you do, and all of the 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 projects that I've seen you pursue are really, you know, seem to come from this place. But I wonder for you, what's that like? What's that like to come from a, a group of people who don't necessarily respect, you know, so that not everybody in the activist organizing community. And I mean, I've, and I've been in spaces that, that, because you're always accessible, you're always available, you're always in the community. And I've been in places where there's very like radical organizing going on and you will just be driving by and see something happen and just jump out of the car. Same car that you were driving, you know, 10 years prior. Same, same mm -hmm. suit, same, you know, the whole thing. Same, yeah. same brother Keith. And this is when you were in Congress. Jump yeah. out of the car and just like, hey, what's going on? Like, what's the, you know what I mean? <laughs> do, yeah. do, you ever, do you ever have a sense, um, you know, thinking about your 22-year-old your, your self, you know what I mean? That, that like, man, I'm inside now. Like I'm inside the, I'm in the belly of the beast now. You know what? The, the, the society is, is, is all these concentric circles. So you go through one wall and you find out that there's people even way more inside than you. And I can tell you, man, when I ran for a Democratic 
national committee chairman, I found out how much outside I really, I found out how much outside I was and how much inside I wasn't, mm, mm, <laughs> you mm, know. Mm. So uh, that's an interesting uh, experience. But what I will tell you is that we have a, um, w- when you're an activist, you, you got to remember what your goal is and what's the, and what you're trying to get done. Because it is possible as an activist to just fall in love with the fight. And so you do, you view legitimate, real progress as just some fake because you don't even believe it. I think it's important for every activist to do a lot of spiritual um, uh, exercise and to always check back to make sure that you don't get cynical. Um, Because once you get cynical, it gets hard to make a decision as to what is what is actually a good thing and what is not. And, you, and, and nothing is good after a while, right? If, if you don't make sure that you um, do, a, do a reset check-in mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, and so I, I think that when, when, when I was, uh, I have a picture of myself talking to a lawyer named Stephen Cooper, who was the head of the Department of Human Rights back in like 1991, and we're asking him to uh, take over a case uh, that occurred uh, back then, right? So like people asking me to take over police prosecutions now, I myself was doing that back in 1991, Mm. you know, regarding Tysell Nelson and stuff like that. So, So what is my point? I I mean, I, I don't, I'll just tell you this, and I could be wrong, but this is what I believe. I don't really believe that there's any uh, society anywhere on the globe that has, that is uh, morally superior to the one I live in. Because if you say, well, America has a hero, horrible history of slavery, racism, this, that, that, I'm like, it's all true. But does India, does, does Great Britain, does China, does, I mean, wh- where where is this? pristine place that if we go there that nobody's ever oppressed anybody else. So what you end up with is a situation where what I got to do is make the world a better place where I am. That's what that's what you got to do. Because there's no place on this planet where everybody has always only loved everybody else. It's just not true. So you got to work where you're at. And then you got to ask yourself, well, cool. Uh, what is better? Here's what's better. What's better is don't get killed. No, you know, justice. Everybody faces this equal standard of justice. The, the, these these things are improvements. And I say to young folks all the time. I mean, there's a book I love, but sometimes I feel like it's mistitled. It's called The New Jim Crow. Mm, Michelle Alexander. And I would say I've said to young people, no, Jim Crow was actually way worse than this. <laughs> you wouldn't want to live through it. In our and, and the sacrifices of our ancestors that have gotten us to racial, multiracial democracy with racism still a problem is better, right? We had racism in 1619. We got racism now. Back then we had slavery. Then we went to Jim Crow. Now we're in multiracial democracy on paper where we have to push the society to be even better. The next step is to have a Society that is a non-racist society, but we still might have sexism. We still might have class oppression. We still might have a lot of other problems we've got to work on. We're in this, I believe we're in this space because God wants to know, are you willing to struggle for something better? Or are you just, what are you going to do? If I put you, it's like the sword of the spider. Do you believe that you'll be left alone on saying um, you believe? Do you believe you'll be left alone on saying I believe? They won't be tested. They were tried before you. Yeah, they're gonna. They were tested before you. Thinking you will be. Yes, and so th- that's sort of how I understand the world. So, I guess what I'm saying is, there's a difference between a elected public official and an activist. The activist needs to keep in mind that you're agitating to make the society bend toward justice, and the elected public official has to understand and keep in mind. You're there to make the society more just. One is an advocate and one is one who's supposed to deliver. Both are needed. They should work symbiotically. They shouldn't work across purposes. 
But I tell politicians all the time, oh, you used to be an activist out there and now they're yelling at you and you're upset. Don't take it personally. Take it seriously. <laughs> you know, keep that in mind. How, they, they don't know what's in your heart. They see what you're doing or not. Yes, doing, sir. And they're going to hold you accountable on that. So, I mean, those are some of the ideas that I have about that, brother. I, I got to be honest, I'm still struggling with the answers. Man, I appreciate that greatly. I appreciate that incredibly. You know, when you made the decision to leave Congress, which to some people may seem more prestigious, you know, like just witnessing your life during that yeah. time. There, I mean, it, like there was nothing enviable about that doggone job, man. Like every, like I said, like <laughs> our friendship is 25 years of 15 minute conversations because everybody yeah. is trying to pull you and talk to you and tell you about their thing. And you're giving them your attention and your time and your advice. And, you know, sometimes people you're saying, okay, write that down and call this number and we'll see what we can do about that. Um, but when yep. you made the decision to leave that position and then go to the attorney general office of the state of Minnesota, you know, a lot of people questioned that. And a lot of people said, well, you know, isn't that a step down? But as the attorney general of the state of Minnesota, I mean, you've done things that attorneys general before you have never done. And I got like a greatest hits list right here that I, <laughs> that I put together because it's so ill. You... so. Correct me if I'm wrong. So as Attorney General of the State of Minnesota, you are the head uh, officer of the state, and you're also an attorney. The head legal, the head office. legal officer of the state. Okay. Yeah. So you can sue people and prosecute people on behalf of the people of, of the state of Minnesota. So it, it'll say yes. that the people of the state of Minnesota are prosecuting or bringing lawsuits against so-and-so. Keith Ellison, on behalf of the people of Minnesota. You've yes. sued lum you've sued slum lords. Yeah, we just got through suing a bad one. And I know about your housing work, so I, I think we can appreciate this last Dude. one. Talking about this guy named uh Stephen Meldahl. And this dude, 167 families, and he uh I'll just I'll be brief, uh, Brother Ali. I mean, one one woman reported. She could not go into her bathroom, which she paid for in her rent, because the squirrels had completely taken it over. And all she could do was just keep that door locked and keep the squirrels in the bathroom. Another woman said, I could not leave any food in the cabinet. <clears throat> um, and we had to put it all in the refrigerator because unless it was a can, uh, we couldn't, we couldn't, it would just get infested. Another uh, woman said that the landlord would call her up and cuss her out. He had provisions in the lease that were patently illegal and against Minnesota state law. It was awful. And he's, for example, he said, you have, you cannot call city inspections until you call me first. That's, that's not the mm -hmm. law. So um, legal aid did came to us and they said, we, we can, we need your help on this. I'm like, well, absolutely. So we sued this dude and the court found against him on everything. And the court has language in his order that says, these are like plagues of biblical proportions, mm. rats, gnats, and uh, infestations. And, and so, and, and get, who was this? These are moms mm -hmm. and their kids. My, and there was a few men in there, but overwhelmingly low-income moms and their children. I'm like, you, you know, you wouldn't tie a dog up in that place mm -hmm. if you'd written it to her. Oh, Ali, for top dollar. You think her rent was like way low because the place was un substandard? No, he's charging what you what you're gonna pay in a whole in anywhere else in Minneapolis, right? So we're doing more. We, we just uh, we're suing some folks in Southwest Minnesota. We're not just keeping it in the inner city. We're doing it. There's a lot of people who live in what they call trailer parks, but are really manufactured housing, mm -hmm. and they get treated really mm -hmm. bad. You know. And let me tell you, because um, you know you've been a real housing champion. The thing about the thing about if you rent, then the landlord has certain statutory obligations, whether they meet them or not. You need somebody to make them do it. When it comes to manufactured housing or so so called trailer parks, they say you're going to buy that trailer. It's yours, not mine. I don't have to fix it. I'm renting you the privilege of putting it on my land. Mm -hmm. So it's like saying. I don't have to do nothing for the upkeep of that unit. 
But I do have some obligations around making sure that the little roads are drivable. Yeah. And so we we went after some a couple of really bad landlords in Wilmer and in Worthington who are just treating people really bad. And, you know, here's the thing about race. You know, we, we, we think in terms of it a lot, but these folks are mm-hmm. white, <laughs> you yeah. know, and they, they're living in a they're basically living in a white ghetto in that trailer park. Few Latinos in there, but mostly yes, white. Sir. Yeah. You sued on behalf of the people in Minnesota. You sued Google and Facebook. You yeah. sued the, the manufacturers of opioids. You sued Juul, they the vaping it. company. You sued yeah. uh, uh, ExxonMobil. Mm-hmm. You sued Comcast, Liars. CenturyLink, and Frontier. Is that for giving bad internet in the hood? No, well... <laughs> It dep- yes, if you understand, hood means um, Zimbrota uh, and Northside. Okay, <laughs> right? all right, there, we, so, there it is. So, 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 CenturyLink and Comcast were give, were paying, charging top dollar and giving crappy service in the cities. Mm-hmm. But Frontier is a very rural internet service provider, okay. and it's one of the things that we really am trying to do, Ali, is help people understand. You live in Crookston. If you really believe your life is you're getting treated so much better or where I mean, if you, you know, you think that you're a world apart from many mm-hmm. others, you're not a world apart. you got the same problems. You just have a further drive than the people. All right. Yes, sir. Lives. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so we're trying to show people their common humanity. Mm-hmm. I think that's the real goal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. To help folks see that what you're going through and what they're going through is the same. Man, I was on a call last night with a group called Land Stewardship Project. Pro- project. And they were t- and this doctor got on the call. He said, look, I'm a doctor in Winona, outside of Winona. There's not that many of us out here. Let me tell you, I have to stay on the phone with the insurance companies for hours. They make me, before I prescribe medicine, I got to get prior approval from them. I've been practicing medicine 50 years. These people aren't even doctors. They call it cost containment. I call it them getting more profits. This is what rural people, and if you're trying to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist in greater Minnesota, you might wait six months. All, I mean, we have lost 700 dairy farms since 2007. But people are still drinking milk, and there's just as many cows being pumped as before. Mm-hmm. But they've been getting consolidated because our, 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 our antitrust laws are not being enforced. So you end up with somebody who's had a farm in three for three generations in their in their family, and they can't survive unless mom has a job as at the lunch as a lunch lady at the local school, mm-hmm. and dad is uh, fixing cars on the side, and then maybe they could make it. Farming shouldn't be a hobby. Farming should be a way of life. And you know, and the do- and if you look at farm profitability as a dollar, it used to be that the people milking the cows would get. 45 cent, 50 percent of that dollar. Man, they're down to like seven cents on that dollar. And all the money is going. uh, None of the money is in making the raw material. It's all in later on down the line. And uh, it's really, really awful. And what divides us is this false idea that you're a different religion. You're a different color. You're not like me. We don't live. We're not. We don't live. We live far apart. I'm like, all that is superficial stuff. Let's figure out how we can get together. Oh, and by the way, this might find, you might find this interesting. There are more deadly force encounters with police in greater Minnesota than in the Twin Cities. Absolute fact. And I can prove it. You know, um, that might surprise some people. They think, oh, this is an inner city Mm -hmm. problem. This is an all around problem. I tell everybody, if you ever watch the movie, the show, The Dukes of Hazard, the whole premise of the show. I was not expecting the to, to drop of a Dukes of Hazard reference. <laughs> well, let me just say the entire pre- the entire mm. show is about how these low income white uh-huh. guys uh-huh. are uh-huh. in this conflict with the sheriff. Okay, right. That's what the whole isn't right. I mean, if you're my age, you remember the oh, show. Yeah, yeah. Bo and Luke Duke and Daisy and so, Duke with the yeah. And Boss Hog and yeah, Cletus. Right. And, yeah, oh yeah. Right, all of that. But the entire show 
is about, it's a comedy, of course, but it is about the tension between these low income farm boys and law enforcement, right? Isn't that what the show's yes, about? Sir. And how they go back and forth and how you didn't get me and you, and I didn't do anything anyway. And that's the whole show. Smokey and the bandit. Mm-hmm. Smokey's not the good guy. There's a lot of tension between white communities and law enforcement, but we don't somehow because of race, we don't really talk about it. Right. But it's there. Right. But we don't really have a good way of of even trying to address it. Um, but it but it, it, it does exist. I, I have sometimes speculated and I'll admit I do that, that, you know, because of the um, the artificialness of race. Um, I think black communities are like, look, I'm a, my folks were in slavery. Then we were in Jim Crow. Now we have societal racism. I, I, I know that the system's not on my side, mm-hmm. but if you're white, you might be raised to believe, oh, yeah. well, this thing, oh, what am I complaining about? I mean, if you're white and you get missed and you get a bad in- incident with the police, I think there's an inc- there's a sense of like, well, what did you do? Mm-hmm. Because we know that they didn't do anything wrong. Although maybe they did, right? So I don't know. You and I can sort that out some other time. You don't see the protests in the white community when unfortunate incidents happen. Mm-hmm. You do see them in the black community. But you did see Ru- Christine Rustek killed, you know, like that. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know where I even started, brother. No, yeah. <laughs> it just occurred to me. No, talking about these, these, these are just really incredible. You know, I could, I could talk to you for hours and um, I feel just so grateful for your time but you've been really 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 generous with your time and with yourself and with your story and I really appreciate it but you know when you when you talk about these the human connection between people what I would like to leave on is to really get a sense of your well let me let me say this first I saw when your when your beloved mother passed away from COVID, you were saying that prior mm-hmm. to that, at the very beginning of the pandemic, you were speaking to and advocating for the Hmong community because they have really sure. specific like cultural practices around around death and dying and end of life and and memorial and burial and and all of these things that because of the yep. pandemic they were having real difficulty with like how do we carry this out, and you said that mm-hmm. I was speaking with them at one point as their public servant as somebody who you know was in the, had this position held this position and sat in this office that cared about them as their public servant but then when my own mother passed away when your own mother passed away it changed your relationship with what it meant for somebody to pass away during a pandemic and to try to figure out what you're going to you know and then you describe the the scenario with the church and what have you so mm-hmm. i wonder if that might it's if true. that if that might you know and i i want to just give you space as we close out this conversation. There's something about this legacy in general, and you in particular, that seems to be able to take the human experience of pain, difficulty, you know, the 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 fight for wholeness, the fight for community, the fight for love, the fight for justice, the roadblocks that one encounters along the way, that you've been able to take all of the all of the difficulty and all of the challenges of life and convert it into this amazing uh, service of community, you know, and of people. And I wonder if at the end of your career, and Mel, I'll give you a long life and give you success in, in all of the best of your intentions and, and your endeavors. At the end of your time, if you were to say, this is what I've contributed and this is what my legacy means, what would that sound like to you? That everybody counts and everybody matters. That <clears throat> nobody's outside my circle of compassion and that um, and that service is a uh, uh, is redemptive and even therapeutic mm. for the human soul and it served me well and I do think about the end of my service I mean when I walked away from Congress you're right people are like well why would you leave the major leagues and go play in the minor leagues I'm like I'm not that's not what I'm doing I'm going from the from the 
in front of the cameras fight to the real fight, right? That's what I saw myself doing. But there will be a day when I'm not the AG anymore and, there, and I'm not any. I'm just a private citizen. And um, I don't think... I, I don't think that I am the AG. What I am, if I'm anything, is, a, is basically a civil rights worker. And um, I'm going to be that in office or out, right? And, uh, and so that's kind of what, uh, what I have in mind for, for how I'm going to try to serve, right? And, uh, and I'm going and, and to always make it a priority to enjoy the work, and if it's not fun, I'm not doing it anymore. And um, and I'm also going to try to, you know, and actually as I get older, I do think a lot more about um, life after life after public service, life after, you know. And then, and then you still have to learn how to do something with the concept of eldering, right? One of my detractors said to me the other day, oh, man, you're looking old. I'm like, well, I am 58 years old. I'll be 59 in a few months. Thank God, you know, uh, I guess uh, the alternative would be that I'd be pushing up daisies right now. But my point is... I think you look like the, I think you look like a, the full moon, man. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, yeah, well, you know, you know, people say what they say. But my point is, eldering is an important thing, right? And um, eldering is important. And it is important to embrace it, embrace it, right? How can we, and, you know, I'm actually, I don't know, quite a bit older than you are, but how, how, how can we, as men, who God, we hope, will bless us many years, when we get those experiences, make sure that they're beneficial to people who are coming through, right? That's another very important. I told my staff the other day, our internship programs represent a core value and commitment our office has to developing talent, right? And so that is that can be um that can work for anybody. And I would say that once you cross 40 years old, you need to be thinking about um how you can how you can give something. You knew you knew Mel Reeves well Absolutely. didn't you? Yeah. And like Mel, Mel was Mel was mentoring people. Man, Mel was. was giving back. Yeah, he had a he had a, a, yeah. a group called the Study Do Group. He said, "We're not going to have a study group. Yeah. We're going to have a Study Do Group." And yeah, that yeah. he he mentored a lot of young people. Yeah, Mel was an amazing man. Yeah, and it's 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 the, bless him, man, and it's there for all of us. But let me tell you, brother, I'm so proud of you, man. And uh, can I ask you Please. a question? Are you um? Making music there in uh, Istanbul. Yes, sir. Yeah, so right back here where these lights All are right. hanging, this is a this is a, a booth, and um, so we're doing the podcast, and I'm making music, and I'm also stu- I'm learning to recite the Quran properly. Finally, for you know, it's funny. Like in America, I was just talking to Imam Zaid Shakar, who sends his love and his salams. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And um, he was, you know, he was saying. You know, Brother Ali, he's like in America, especially if you're in the inner city, if you know the Arabic alphabet, you're the imam. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I was an imam at Masjid al-Nur for, you know, 15 years as like a, as a 17-year-old kid, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you were always a great student, though, man. There's no doubt about I'm that. I'm finally learning the Arabic language. I'm finally learning to recite the Quran. Those are two of the things that I'm doing here. And... Um, you know, my wife is one of a handful of uh, black women therapists in the Twin Cities, you know, in that great sure. uh, tradition with uh, Brother Resma. And so she sees her clients oh, yeah. online. So we both, we both, you know, I have this office and she works from our home. And so at nighttime, when the babies go to bed, she gets busy in her thing and I get busy with, in mine. Well, give my salams to the dear sister and tell her we're so proud of her too. And hey, look, man, um, I do look forward to seeing you in the flesh soon. Man, uh, you know, there are people in, in, uh, in history that we look up to and we admire and we wish we could have met them. And, you know, knowing you and, and loving you and calling you a brother and being able to witness you and how sincere you are, how authentic and genuine you are, how selfless you are, how giving you are, how loving you are. And just, you know, it's, it's, it's really one of the great blessings of my life, man. Um, you know, I just can't tell you that, you know, hearing that trial here in Istanbul in the, in the cab and the man asking me the questions that he was asking and 
you know, and then when the verdict came through, you know, there's just moments where you're like, this is a mo this is a moment in history that I'm witnessing. And to be, you know, to be connected with you, it's, it's just really incredible, man. And to hear so much about well, you know, your family and the, the, the lineage that you come from and the people that poured into you and invested in you. I just, I really, I can't appreciate it. I can't, uh, I can't overstate my appreciation, man. I love you dearly, brother. Love you dearly too, brother. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Salam alaikum. Zakola here. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for being with us on the Travelers Podcast. I want to give a special thanks to Keith Ellison. Thank you so much, Attorney General, sir, for your time and for sharing yourself with us. Uh, make sure to like and share and subscribe and comment. All that stuff that people say on podcasts, it's true. It really helps the podcast be seen and heard by people who may enjoy it and benefit from it. Go to brotherali.com. You can sign the mailing list. You can go to the event section to see all of the dates and events that we have coming up in a city near you. Go to the join section and you can get down with the caravan to become part of the community and the support that keeps this podcast going. Check out the merch, check out the catalog, check out all the stuff we have on brotherali.com. Special thanks to Amna Mirza, to Mansour Panawala, to my man, DJ Last Word, my man that does the graphic design for the Travelers podcast. Amir Rahman, thank you to my man Ant for producing the Travelers song and allowing us to use that music as the theme song for the podcast. Thank you, Darian Washington. Uh, thank you to Mark from Medina who designed the stamp logo that we use as the logo for the podcast. Traveler's Podcast is produced by Brendan Kelly, a.k.a. BK1, and it is a production of Traveler's Media. Thank you so much. Make sure to come back every week wherever you get your podcast. Signing off. Peace and love. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.